means money. That means the money side of the business. Um, in my class, I teach a portion of this. So if you've taken my class, some of you has here, um, this may be a little repetitive for you. Um, but uh, the concept of the capital markets is all about how developers or owners of real estate finance or uh, get the capital for their projects. So we're going to walk through a lot of different scenarios of how they do it, how it's structured, um, how us real estate people look at capital. Um, as a developer of product, uh, the capital is one of 20. Um, there's massive industries regarding um, this business. You can just be in the capital side. I was on the capital side uh, for 20 years before I became a developer. That's kind of how I learned the business. Um, so again, uh, people online or you guys have questions, please stop me at any time. Um, I usually do a lot of writing on the board in my class, uh, but I'm going to probably do less of that here just because people I don't, can't see it, but I mean, I still may do it because I'm, I'm an old school kind of guy. All right. This changes the thing, right? The space bar? Oh, the space bar. Oh, no. <laughs> No. Well, I did it that way. <laughs> I did it from the mouth. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Macedo. Um, I went to undergraduate here and was a marketing major. Um, I was going to actually go into advertising. My father was in the advertising business. Um, and I, was actually, I actually was offered a job in the advertising business. Uh, but I ended up getting a job as a commercial broker at a company called Marcus and Milichek. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of that company, but um, I was in the brokerage business and kind of didn't like the brokerage business, but fell in love with real estate. Um, I personally like real estate because real estate is tangible. Uh, you buy a piece of property, they're not making any more land. So it's product uh, that uh, is always ever changing. It never goes away and there's always an opportunity with it. So I always, I always like physically owning properties. Um, I came back and got my MBA in finance in 1994. In 1983, I met my wife here. We've been married 32 years. We have two kids who are older than you guys, so I'm old. Um, and uh, um, when I got into the business, uh, I was in the business uh, about 12 years. Uh, I, I was in the finance business. I worked for a company called Heller Financial. That's where I learned the finance side, the side that we're learning today. Uh, we did about $3 billion of loans, mezzanine loans, joint venture structures, things of that nature um, from that standpoint. Um, and then in 1999, uh, one of the guys who worked there, myself, started our own company called Hanover Financial. And we were a private equity firm. So we raised capital from institutional investors and on, on their behalf, put it into real estate. So if a developer needed money to purchase or develop a property, they came to us uh, for a portion of that capital, for a portion. We were the joint venture partner. We were the equity of deals. So we raised five funds. Uh, we raised about 400 million, did about three and a half billion dollars of deals, over 115 joint ventures. Um, did that for 18 years. Um, sold the company uh, right, before the pan right before the Great Recession of 2009. So some people say, I, you know, you're really smart. I just consider myself really lucky. It was just perfect timing. And of course, the market crashed for three years. Uh, when the market returned, uh, we started developing a uh, property about well, 10 years ago. So we've had the development companies for 10 years. We built seven projects. Um, most of them are on the west side of LA, uh, but we do own some stuff in Denver uh, and some stuff in Arizona. So we focus primarily on multifamily apartments. Um, but the, the concept of finance for uh, we're going to learn today is applicable to any product type, whether it's hotels, commercial office space, uh, even schools for that matter. Um, you know, anything that, uh, anything on a property that needs financing, this is what capital markets is about, okay? All right. Okay, so again, the definition of capital markets, you hear that term, that term is used a lot in the business. 
capital markets is just the place where owners and developers get capital. Pretty simple. It is a multi-trillion dollar industry. Okay. I was in it, as I said, for I was in it for 24 years uh, before we started the development company. Um, it's just where you get it. I call this the, the match.com portion of the development business for the real estate business. And what I mean by that is that whatever you build as an owner, whether you purchase a property, uh, even a house all the way up to a hundred story office building, okay? The concept is, is that you'll need capital unless you want the lottery and can write a check, you're gonna need capital. You're gonna borrow uh, some money from a bank. You're gonna borrow some money maybe from your friends and family or institutional capital if it's a value add or development deal. So the concept, the concept of capital markets is just where you get the money. So there are, there are obviously a lot of different things. There's construction debt for building, acquisition, there's debt, there's equity. We're gonna go into what all that means, what, what debt is or first, trust, first trustees of debt, uh, mezzanine financing, preferred equity, joint venture capital, okay? And the people that provide that, there's probably over, I'm gonna say 10,000 groups in the world that provide capital for real estate. So you think, wow, there's so much capital out there. I should have no problem ever getting my, my project done, right? So the, the key to capital markets is that it is a match.com. So if you're building a 20 unit apartment building in the West side of LA or a hundred story office building in New York, those are gonna be two different capital sources. There's banks that focus just on the small stuff or medium stuff and there's banks that just do large deals. So part of that world is provided those introductions or those, um, those matches are made by an intermedi uh, intermediary or broker. So someone say, hey, you ever heard of a broker? Yeah, they buy and they help sell real estate. Well, there are brokers or intermediaries that intermediate between a developer and banks. The intermediary's job is to find as many banks as he can find, find as many developers or owners of operators as he can or she can, and match it and say, hey, I have all this list of people. Oh, you need 20 units? This bank will do it. Oh, you need equity for that? Oh, this bank will do it. Or this fund will do it. Or whatever the case may be. So the intermediary job gets paid just like a real estate broker gets paid. They get paid a fee or a commission for putting the deal together. And that fee can be anywhere from one to four points of the amount of money that they intermediate. So gee, if you get a $100 million loan, right? You got a point, that's a million bucks of fees. Pretty good business, very competitive business. There's, there's large institutions in it, there's individuals in it. Um, we, we as, uh, users of capital, I used to be a provider of capital, but as a user of capital, we use that intermediary system a lot because you're always, they're always finding a new group that came out, a new group that, hey, this new bank's now into small apartments, or this new bank is now into shopping centers, or this new bank's now into hotels. If banks and capital markets or people who provide capital, they have investment parameters and they change over time depending on what it is. You can imagine that in 2019, if you were a hotel lender, in 2020, you probably weren't a hotel lender. This hotel is pretty, was pretty bad. You may be back into the hotel business now, or the equity groups that do it, or anybody who does it, anybody who, so their strategies may change over time. So we use intermediaries to always keep us up to date about the latest kind of banks or capital markets that, that we don't. Okay. All right. Keep going. Okay, so before we talk about how a deal is financed, we need to talk about how real estate relates to the people who have capital. So capital can either be debt, equity, or whatever the case may be to finance a project, either construction or acquisition of a project, or even a long-term financing of a project, okay? So the people who look at capital in real estate looks at it as an investment alternative. They say, hey, I, CalPERS or large institutions or banks go, hey, we make loans to uh, warehouse companies. We make loans to um, uh, factoring companies. We make loans to GE or whatever the case may be, corporate loans, equipment loans, factoring or clothing, things for manufacturing. Banks will do all that. Real estate is just a cog of many of these banks or institutions um, wheelhouse. So when they do their strategy, if you work for an institution that does this, and we did it for a long time, 
you would go and you would say, what's the strategy? And we'll talk about how a strategy comes about. But the idea is that it's just an investment. So they compare it to stocks, bonds, what they can finance and other things. Everything is an investment alternative. So real estate, everyone goes, gee, it's real estate, it's this, it's cool, whatever. But the concept, it's just a vehicle of finance for the capital markets. It's an, it's a, it's an opportunity to put something in a product that generates a return. Just like if you put your capital in a computer and that generates a return. So whether you invest in software, you invest in hardware, you invest in product, it's just an alternative. Okay. And that's really, that's important to know. So real estate, um, its greatest advantage is land because they just don't make it anymore. So the more real estate you own over a longer period of time, and I'll show you a great chart, but as, as if you look at it, real estate has outpaced almost every investment as an annualized return than any investment almost ever. Okay. So you have to understand that cycles come and cycles go. Okay. Right now, if you bought crypto at 0.001 and now it's at 0.002, you made a lot of money. Right. So you, people, people are throwing money into that because there's a great opportunity for short-term gains, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, and it, but it will go up and down. But the index, I'll show you an index where the concept of real estate is that because land is limited, you have to have uses on real estate, like places for people to live, places for people to shop. It is a necessary product, it makes it a competitive because there's lots of people in it, but it is a necessary product. The, the, uh, the other advantage is when you own income, we're gonna talk primarily about income producing real estate, okay? So not a single family home unless you're renting it out. We're talking apartment buildings. We're talking, or even not even schools. We're talking product that produces income. People pay rent, like Ralph's plays rent right down here. Okay, they don't own their center. Starbucks plays rent. Bristol Farms pays rent. Okay, that collective rent minus expenses is the profit of that particular building. Okay, so if you're the developer and owner of that, right, it's just like if you owned a restaurant, if you own Benny's, he has expenses and revenues, he makes whatever he makes, right? Property is the exact same way, and there's cash flow. The difference between Benny's and, all, and, and the cash flow, unless, and because I've met the owner, but if he's there every day watching his store, right? He's there every day. He's watching his store, then he's really getting paid by the hour in my opinion, right? If you're an attorney, you only get paid when you're working, when you're billing hours. If you are a doctor, you are only getting paid when you are doing surgeries or seeing patients. Generally, that's the case. If you're a dentist, you're only doing that if you're cleaning teeth, right? The great thing about real estate is that you take an investment opportunity, because we've done this. We own, I think, about 4,800 units today. Of those, sort of, they're all generating cash flow, right? I have managers who manage those, just like Starbucks has managers who manage stores, right? So we have this concept in real estate is that you make money while you sleep. And that's one of the great advantages of real estate is that you get to make money while you sleep, okay? And there's nothing about being a doctor or a lawyer or any of those things, but you, those doctors and lawyers are investors with us. So their capital also works and makes money while they're sleeping, right? So there's a, so while we'll always be working, most of our portfolio just generates cash. We do that, we use that cash for building new projects or taking down new land and things that and growing the company, okay? Um, the, the heart, the, the thing about, um, real estate that's difficult is it's exceptionally competitive, very competitive. Give you an idea. We were, we made a bid on a piece of land on the West side in the Palms area. There were 71 offers. This piece of great for this property. When there's 71 offers, someone will always overpay more than I'm willing to do. It, it happened, it's happened for 30 years. I usually try to find properties that are off market. You know, to talk, to build and, and you know either renovate what's there or build something. Okay, very competitive market. Secondly, when you own real estate, it's not liquid like a stock. Okay, so you could say, hey, I'm going to sell my crypto, or I have I was an apple at forty, apples at one hundred and twenty. I'm just going to sell it. You dump it that day on your Fidelity thing, and you're done. Put your money in your bank. You're going to sell a piece of real estate. Got to list it for sale. PSAs. Lots of work to get it done. Escrows due diligence, 
And it could take anywhere from 30 to 90 days to close a project. And if the market's turning or going upside down, people bail out, they don't, you know, so it's less liquid, okay, than stocks. So, you know, there are lots of investment opportunities. Bonds are very liquid, right? Stocks are very liquid. T-bills are very liquid. Real estate's not very liquid. If you wanted to dump it quickly, if you wanted to dump it quickly, there's this, the industry is too sophisticated and we'll take advantage of it. It's too sophisticated. You have to get rid of something fast. Like you, you've heard probably a lot of estate sales, right? Someone passes away, unfortunately, and they have an estate sale. And generally those, unless they have very sophisticated people working for them, a lot of times those people get taken advantage of because they need to liquidate fast for whatever reason. Okay. So it's not a highly liquid business. The other thing is, um, I want to mention, the other thing is that it's highly cyclical. So when the market, when we hit recessions, real estate gets hit. It's hit hard. And the reason it gets hit hard is because, and we'll talk about it in, in a moment, the number one driver of real estate is employment. If people are employed. They rent, they rent an apartment. They go to the movies. They go to the store. They buy the Starbucks. They are servicing all of the services that basically service the real estate. So all those people can pay rent. If you get laid off, you don't do that as much. Okay, people don't go to Starbucks as much, well maybe not Starbucks, but they don't go to that restaurant. You saw in the pandemic how many restaurants closed, right? When the restaurant closes, they're not paying rent, the value of that property goes down. And by the way, since 1929, the great crash, real estate has never not had a cycle. Just so you know. So when everyone talks about Oh, it's never going to end. It's, it's going to be great. It, values are going to go up forever. The answer is partially true, but it will be cyclical. So you have to kind of play when you're a buyer and when you're a seller. And then we'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to, but it didn't work. I couldn't get it to work. What? Because you were. Oh. Because I'm. Let's see. So, anyway, okay. So let's talk about investment types because uh, this is important to how uh, people in the capital markets look at things. So if people in the capital markets look at things, they look at various investment types, okay? They can look at stocks, bonds, even art, antiques, collectibles, crypto. They can look at, there's all kinds of ways for people who have capital to invest their capital. The banks and funds that are in the business of, of basically the banking business, Simple definition of the banking business is I take money in and I pay out to the people who gave it to me X, I invest in a Y and there's a spread. It's a simple, that's the whole business. Every one of these is that business. There isn't one that isn't that business. The money business is about if you gave me a dollar, right? And I paid you a dollar 10 back, but I invested it and made a dollar 20, I made 10 cents. That 10 cents, I pay my salary, I pay my employees, whatever the case may be, okay? So that's the business, it's that simple. So every one of these businesses, um, the mutual fund business, stock business, car collectibles, antiques, real estate, all of those um, are just investment alternatives where the idea is to make a spread. This is the money side of the real estate business. That's why I'm talking about this, okay? So when you look at risk return, everybody who's in this business looks at risk and return, okay? What is the least risky investment in the world? Does anyone know? What's that? The 10 year treasury. The US 10 year treasury. Why is that? Anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, do you think the government's ever going to run out of money? Pretty highly unlikely. Yeah, it's backed by the federal. It has a backing. It's guaranteed. Does anyone know what the 10 year treasury is today? What the rate is? You guys have uh, internet? Look it up. You don't? I think it's about 2.3%. Type in 10 year treasury. See about 2.3% today? Am I right? Kind of gone down. 1.9. Awesome. Wow, that changed quickly. So the 10-year treasury is a 1.9%. So if you bought a 10-year bond, took $10,000, you bought a U.S. government bond, they give you a little certificate, you're making 1.99% on your money. 
So they pay you 1.99%, right? Government takes your money, right? And they run the government. That's basically what they do. They're not, they're the only thing not doing it for spread. <laughs> okay. But the reason people buy, buy treasuries is safety that the US government is not going to default. Okay. Not, they're not going to default. So that's why you get such a low rate. Now, if you're in crypto, your rate better be 2,300, 400 million percent return because it's super highly volatile and you're basically investing in the Ponzi scheme. It's just my opinion, <laughs> but, um, you know, so the concept is super risky. That's just hot. That's called hot potato investing, what we call it, okay? So when you look at the chart, the low, you know, low risk, low return of the money market funds, they are diverse stock funds and they give crappy returns overall, just so you know. And these are all just kind of sector stocks. Where a sector stock, what do you think a sector stock is? Anybody know? How many finance majors do we have here? One, two, three, four, okay. What's a sector stock? It's just a stock of sector of, of a of computer. It could be, it could be uh, all the computer companies, all the movie companies, all the gaming companies, all the car companies. It's a sector of stock. That's all the same type of competition or together. Why do you think sector stocks like the car business or even movie business, if you took all the movie companies together and all the stock companies like Warner Brothers and Sony Pictures and Apple and all that, and put it all together, why is that more risky? Why is that the highest risk on this curve? Anybody? What's a guess? Yeah. Trends usually affect all the sectors. So if a bad trend happens, every company will go down. Correct. So if, if something happens in the car industry, like you can't get any computer chips right now. So we're a thousand computer chips in every car and they can't get any chips today. It hurts the business. You've noticed that a lot of car companies have been um, closing their manufacturing plants every other week because they can't build the cars. There's thousands and thousands of cars sitting in parking lots with no chips. It's very expensive to go back to those cars and put those chips in later. So they just stop and play. So you know what happens? People get laid off. People are worried about that sector. That sector goes down. The whole sector goes down. Because they think whether it's just affecting GM or whatever, it affects every car company. Okay. All right. Real estate, the, uh, as you can see, when we talk about liquidity, real estate's low. Again, tough to get rid of stocks are hot. So people look at when they make investment decisions, my overall return, my overall risk, my overall ability for liquidity. And then what you do if you're in the business is your job, which was my job for 25 years, is to do my best to invest in the best thing. Right. So if you work for JP Morgan, you're trying to find new enough stock companies that you want to buy their stock or whatever the case may be, you know, they come to you and say, Hey, I got this idea. I got this idea to start a car kind of taxi company that independent contractors use. And I'm going to hope it gets the taxi business. What do you think? And I went, What? Are you crazy? Going against the taxi business? That's like old school, like mobster kind of stuff. You want to go against that? I'm out. Well, that was dumb. That became Uber, right? So, so, so much of how you make decisions in the investment world is your ability to understand, have information, and then make good decisions. If you are successful in this business, you make you get hits more than you get misses. Everybody has misses. So if you pick everything, if you pick everything good, you're Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett does more research than anybody in the world when he when he picks a company. So the idea, um, the idea of how people pick investments is really important. Okay. Questions? If not, I will keep going. Okay. So this is the general chart of risk versus return. Okay. So of course, down at the bottom is the U.S. Treasury bill, the lowest risk, lower return. So right now, this is at what, 1.99%? And your risk is pretty much at zero, <laughs> right? So the short-term treasury notes, somebody look up the five-year note. What's the five-year treasury note today? Yeah, 
1.96. It's lower. It's lower today. That's it. You know why? That's an interesting thing. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Common stocks, real estate, options, community, precious metals. And of course, then I put crypto up there just for fun. I, crypto should be off the whole thing. I'm not saying not do crypto. You just have to recognize the risk return ratio. That's all. Okay. When someone says it's a new paradigm shift, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's potentially true. We'll show how that works in cycles. Okay. So simple. We already said it. Why is real estate more risky than common stocks? Less liquid. Pretty much the only reason I can't sell it in an hour and a half, I can sell a stock. That's pretty much the only difference between the two. All of them take market risk, product risk. You're buying a product HP, you're taking this risk, whatever it is. The underwriting of those two things are pretty much the same. So we compare a lot of real estate to the stock market. So if I invest, if I tell an investor, please invest in my property. I have, to, I have to show him a return that's greater than the stock market because it's less liquid. Okay. All right. So this is one of my favorite charts. So everybody thinks in three minute increments is what I call it. Three minute increments is like crypto's good, although crypto's bad, or this is good, or this is bad, right, kind of thing. Does anyone remember the BlackBerry phone? Remember the BlackBerry phone? It's like, yeah, well, it was the phone. I mean, it was the phone. When I was working, if you had a BlackBerry phone, you were cool. I mean, it was cool, right? But so that was the big thing then. So people bought that stock like crazy, but they had an inherent flaw in their, in their whole strategy that some people did pick up. Other people didn't pick up. Does anybody know what happened? Why they died? A while back. What's that? Isn't it such things? Isn't that why everybody adopted the iPhone? They wouldn't adapt to technology. They were so pig-headed. That's how I think. I'm not changing. I have the coolest phone. I'm sorry. But technology said, oh, no, no, no. and they got killed. There's still a BlackBerry today. Right? It does have a touch screen now, ironically. But they are now not the leader of the phone industry simply because of that. Okay. The same with Motorola. You guys remember flip phones? I used to love the flip phone. It reminded me of Star Trek, right? You flip it up and you want to say, Captain, you know, call me, that thing. But, you know, you had the flip phone and Motorola, again, wouldn't adapt. Right? And they're pretty much out of the business for the most part. There's a lot of other factors. But the idea, the idea of, of people thinking 500 increments is really good if you're in the short-term investment business. You have to be really good in the short-term investment business. Okay. So let's look at this real quick. So the red line, the red line here is the SP overall return from 1994 to 2012. What's the biggest thing you notice about the red curve? It's very volatile. So if you're super smart. You know, you had hundred dollars invested in the stock market by 1999. It was worth four times its amount. What happened in 2000? Do you remember? Dot com bust because all those that stock value was like, oh my goodness, it's all the dot coms and the S and P, and it crashed. So so the index went way down. So now it's still, it's still worth more than what you had it, right? So the big run up here, obviously 2008, what happened in 2009? The Great Recession that was caused by fraud of real estate financing, by the way. Anyone see the big short? If you are in this business, you should watch the big short. It's the greatest movie that shows fraud of how people are duped. It was unbelievable. And if it wasn't for the government, we would have gone into a greater recession, but they didn't bail us out. There's lots of debate about that. But so it crashed again. And in 2012, I didn't have the chart later, but obviously the pandemic, it went down again. So stocks are very volatile because you know why? They're very liquid. I'm panicking, I gotta sell. Oh, I was at 400, I sold at 350, but I bought it at 100. I'm good. 
and it goes down and down and down. Well, at least I didn't lose any money. So the volatility is because of its liquidity. That's why you see that, okay? Because the idea is that if you invested $100 and just left it there, never panicked, never did anything, you bought an index fund, it's worth five times today what you bought it for. So the concept of investing is two types of investors, the long-term investors and the ones who try to beat this curve. That's what the capital markets is. That's what we try to do for a living. We're going to try to beat the curve. We buy something that we're going to hold forever. Okay? Because your index is always going to go up. Now, the blue line is the 30-year U.S. Treasury. Pretty safe bet, right? Probably no less, uh, no less risky than the 10-year, right? So what happened to the, the, the Treasury? How does that line look? So you put $100 in the U.S. Treasury, right? That bond is now worth what? Five times what that bond was back in 1994. So the concept is, the concept is it's cheap. I could have put it in, I could have bought a bond, I could have done a stock market, could have walked away for 25 years. And I'm in the exact same place. So investors, this, this is the great, um, the great fallacy of investments. So if you go work for JP Morgan or a fund, or a bank, okay, where you work for that. We had a fund where we had CalPERS in our fund. They gave us $100 million. We take $100 million and we invest in real estate. They want to beat an, an average. They want to earn at least 12% on their money. Can't really get that in the stock market over time, unless you're going to hold for 25 years, okay? You know, kind of thing. But they need to have gains because CalPERS is the pension fund. They have to grow the pension fund in order to pay people their pensions, all of the people who are firemen and police chiefs and stuff, they need, they need to grow that capital to pay out those, those benefits and to those, those people, because they get the benefits for life if you're, if you're a public service worker, okay? So they take a chunk of their billions of dollars and they stick it in real estate because they need to grow it. Now, what they do is they have to have a gain. They need the actual cash. So if they put in a million dollars, they have to get the three million back because they're paying out. So most of real estate, plays the short game. You should never really do that. Most of real estate finance plays the short game. Banks make three-year loans. If you're going to, if you're going to uh, build an apartment building, you need a construction loan. That construction loan is, is probably two years to three years, enough to build it, to get it leased. They turn their money and they go do another construction loan. Now, there are long-term lenders who do permanent loans, you know, five, seven, 10-year loans. But the longest loan you can get it in the commercial business is probably uh, 10 years. You can get longer, but most of them are 10-year loans. So they're always turning money. So there's this kind of strange mismatch in the investment world of, I want short-term gains in a volatile market. So you need really smart people to pick right. Because if, if CalPERS is stuck $100 billion in the stock fund, in 1994, it's worth 500 million without doing anything. I don't want to worry, making quarterly reports. Oh my gosh, the dot com thing, sell all the stocks, panic. Real estate's the exact same way. Okay. Now, the real estate industry has a organization that measures, like the SP index. There's a, there's a company called NACREF, which stands for the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries. And what it is, it's, an, it's, a, it's a nonprofit, basically tracks the return of real estate. The real estate people could say, how am I doing against everything else? Okay, how am I, what's, it's just, a, it's just that index that we saw, you know, 100 to 500, they give the same exact index value of property. Properties are valued in two ways, overall appreciation and cash flow. Okay. So the cash flow it generates every year, and if it's worth more or less at the end of the at the end of the period, that's how they measure it. Okay. So, so they created their own index, and the number one goal of investment, almost for anything, is to beat inflation. Okay. That's the number one goal. So if you're investing in a 10-year treasury right now, 
at 1.99%. What was inflation last quarter? Anyone? It's, on, it's all in the news. Anybody know what it was? 7%. You're losing money, right? You're losing five percentage basis points in your investment because you're not outpacing the cost. The cost of this computer just went up 7%, but your investment only went up 1%. You've lost money now. So the number one investment goal of anyone in the business is to beat inflation. That's the first one. Everything else is cost of doing the business, profits, and returns to investors. So if I invest a dollar, okay, if I invest a dollar, we'll do, we'll do the math, and I don't know if you can see this, but at home. All right, if you invest a dollar, okay, and the CPI, or what we call consumer price index, goes up 6%, okay, and your investment went up 4%, you've lost 2%, okay? So now your, your investment's only worth $98. Okay, you've lost money because the cost of goods have gone up that thing. Okay, now the idea, and I'm saying, the idea that we care about, we're going to talk about, it's all about the spread. Okay, banking spread. Banking spread is the cost of the money that the bank or the institution has to pay for, all of the salaries and costs to, to run the business, profit that's necessary and return to the investor, okay? So let's just say that Bank of America, let's be savings account in Bank of America, no more, percent We'll just call it 1%, for fun, okay? So Bank of America's cost of their money is 1%. Let's say their salaries allocated around the whole company is 4%, profits 2%. Okay, and the return spread that they want to their investors is four percent. Okay, this is not the case in Bank of America. I'm just giving you an example. Okay, so you basically you need to put out money at eleven percent. Now they don't because they deal in billions. They put out money like about six percent and they home loans three percent, and that's because really <laughs> this cost is about twenty four one percent CDs that we run. Right, so the business is all about Cost of your money, your overhead, okay, profit, and what you pay your investors. Bank of America, that's their shareholder, right? So in the real estate business, it's exactly how it works for us. So as a developer, if I have a property, right, I have a cost. I have a cost for running my business, right? I have to pay the investors a certain amount. So if I pay the if I if I pay the investors 12%, I can lose money for doing my job. You don't want to do that, okay? So this index, CPI index has always been relatively flat with a few bumps, jumped up quite a bit just recently. Um, but the index here, this is the, this is the S&P, which is outperformed Natecrief and Nate, the index um, overall, which would indicate that, that people are overpaying for real estate over time, right? Or the value, or the value of the real estate essentially changed. Now, NARI is, uh, that's the index that tracks public companies that use money, like real estate investment trusts, okay? Does anyone know what a REIT is? It's just a public stock. As opposed to being an investor in a property, you buy stock in a company that buys property, okay? So the idea is that these indexes, if these indexes are dropping below here, you're doing a bad job, okay? Right. So this is recent, at the end of 2021, Here's the treasury index, right? The little dot, these are all, all these global MBS, IG Corps, high, high mini funds. Those are all treasury stocks. They're not treasuries and bonds. So because inflation at the end of 2021 had grown so, so bad, if you held any of those, see those dots, that means that you've lost money, okay? On the other side, senior loans or debt, which will, that's what we're gonna be talking about, has outperformed. Does anyone know why it's outperformed so much greater in inflation? The hard one. The reason that real estate typically performs well in high inflationary markets. What's that? No, no, the loan stays the same. 
the concept is the concept is the when the market is doing when the market has inflation generally the market's doing well overall right I mean, forgetting COVID, it's a strange, COVID is kind of a strange CPI because this is more of a supply chain issue, but the market's still doing well, okay? So the real estate market in most cases is doing pretty well. It had that big dip in 20, we'll, we'll show you, I'll show you that. But generally when the market does well and there's inflation, rents do better. And when rents do better, people can pay off their loans better. So they perform better overall, okay? So, So what are the typical average annual returns over long periods of time for these types of indexes? So the NACREF index, as I said, they talk about cash, they measure it in cash, they measure it in capital appreciation, the property's just worth more, okay? And they measure it um, overall. So the NACREF index over the last 25 years has been about an 8% compounded annualized return, which is pretty good. 8% compounded over 25 years, if you did that on your calculator, your property's worth a lot more, <laughs> okay? Now, OCD funds are just different. These are value-add funds and opportunistic funds just take more or less risk. So let's say that uh, I raise $100 million from investors and I'm an opportunistic fund. I take bigger risk. I'm gonna buy raw land and title it and build, okay? A value-add fund is I'm gonna take an existing apartment building, Mr. Investor, and I'm gonna fix it up, raise the rents and create value. So even, even in the segment of investors, they'll invest money in different types of funds, depending on what that operator does for a living. Oh, I only invest with guys who do the West Coast, the East Coast. I do only apartments. I only do industrial. I know hundreds and hundreds of funds that are specialized. Okay. So these, you know, the, the listed REITs have been about 10. Go ahead. Okay. So just a couple snapshots um, of real estate returns, okay? So in the real estate return world, and from 2000 to 2014, which was 22 years ago now, I'm old. Um, you know, the cash in the savings bank averaged 3%. So that's what you get from putting your money in the bank. Bonds did a little bit better. Stocks did okay, but real estate kicked everyone's butt. We'll talk about why, because we do leverage returns. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. We leverage our returns. Okay. That gives us more. It's like if you, if you leverage your stock, right? You buy, you buy a certain amount of stock and you leverage that four to one, you'll make four times your money, but you have $3 of debt, right? Same thing with real estate. If you cost $20 million to build a project, if I have $20 million, I write a check. I just get the return, whatever the cash flow generates, right? But if I if I borrow 65% at 4%, which are where rates are, I'm going to increase my return on, on the capital I did. We'll show you that in a minute. So in 2015, when the market was on fire, obviously gold and precious silver are out because the markets, well, people feel very comfortable in the marketplace. So they get rid of their gold and they put it in stuff that's growing. Investors and capital people are always putting their money, again, they're trying to beat the curve. They're always trying to beat the curve, okay? So that's why you see up and downs with that, okay? But still, the S&P actually went down in 2015. It had to do with some, a few different things. But again, real estate kicked everyone's butt, okay? So if you're, a, if you're an investor or you work for, oops, So real estate's real niche in the business is long-term appreciation. I use my parents' house as an example, okay? My parents bought a house in La Cunada, California. Does anyone know where that is? Mm -hmm. Right next to Pasadena. I live three blocks from the Rose Bowl. The average home price in La Cunada today is $2.9 million. There's an area called La Cunada Flintridge, which is on one side of the area. The average home price is $4.3 million. Okay. My parents bought their first house in La Cunada for $17,500. They had to borrow money from my aunt. My dad was making $400 a week. It's kind of funny, right? You can't even buy a car for $17,500. Okay. 
When I came here to school in 1982, they sold the house for $345,000 and they thought they'd kill me. They thought they killed it, which they did. Dr. 17 sold for 345, it's pretty good, right? Well, uh, my friends who I grew up there moved back to La Cunada and their good friends live in my old house. It's just appraised at $4.4 million. Now they fixed it, up. you know what you want. But still, real estate's true inherent value is long-term appreciation. The reason I tell that is because all of the money in our business thinks short-term. I gotta beat the curve. When in reality, real estate kicks everything. If you look at the last 30 years, you know, it was it was two and a half times that of the S&P. 1,800% increase. Average annual kicks its butt. So in, in what we've done, because I was in the short-term business, I was in the equity business where I had to beat the curve, okay? All the properties that we do today, we're just holding them. I'm going to give them to my kids, hopefully their grandkids. We're going to manage them well, because I know they'll be worth four or five times what they're going to be today. Even though today you go, I can't believe what the prices of things are. Do you know that Westchester just listed its first $6 million home? And there's a house at um, Dumbarton, brand new white house on Dumbarton and Adia. That sold for 4.9 million bucks. Or 3.9, excuse me, 3.9. I bought my house here in Westchester for $175,000. Big difference. Like I said, I'm old. <laughs> so the concept is I know people think in short term increments when they think about investments. Oh, stock was here and here. And there's nothing wrong with that. But real estate is always a better long play. Okay. Always. Which is why I'm going to teach you the short term version of financing. <laughs> okay. So you say to yourself, why not real estate all the time? Forget the stock market. I'm, I'm killing it. I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, I, I, what am I doing? I should just stick into real estate and never do anything else. Well, real estate is very cyclical, just like the market. Okay, We have recessions. Okay, A recession is generally defined by job loss and GDP loss from a prior period. Okay, Employment drives the world. So if people, like I said, if people are employed, they buy things. We are, a consumer, we are a consumer country, right? So if employment goes down, everything goes down because you do less things, okay? So this is, this is as I said, you know, from 1960, there's always been recessions. There will always be recessions. There will always be recessions. This one, this particular recession was quite crazy because it had to do with the pandemic. I've never personally experienced that. I've produced, I've seen over building, I saw 9-11, I saw the dot-com bust. I saw the tax change in 1985. That's a whole other thing that came about. This one right here, this tax change, the interest rate spiked. The banking rate at the time in 1982 was 17%. Can't really borrow money at 17%, pretty hard. Okay. Remember the value of real estate is 100% tied to what you can borrow. So if you could borrow money at 5%, your value of your property is certain. If you borrow money at 17%, if you don't have, you know, win the lottery, you can't just write a check, right? Your property's worth less. And I'll get, I'll, we'll show you the math. Okay. So, so the last two big recessions were really in 1991, 92, 2008, 2009. Everybody knows the global financial crisis that happened. And then the third one is obviously the pandemic. Okay. But I call that the surprise one. Okay. This one literally was because of our industry. Greedy developers building product with capital people giving it to it because they thought the world was never going to end. Okay. So if you were around in 19, between 1988 and 94, there was a large influx of capital that came to the U.S. from Japan. Billions of dollars. And they wanted, there was money being moved here for it could be political investment, whatever the reasons that were at, because, you know, Japan then went into a 10 year recession, right? That they're probably still not really out of yet. But what happened was they came here and they just started buying cars. They didn't care what they were paying for. They just wanted to park the money. So what happened is they were buying downtown office buildings. And the office building may have been worth 50 million, but they were paying 70. When people do that, the capital markets went off. 
this is great. They're coming in buying money. So what happened was is that construction lenders and the investment funds and all this gave developers money to build more product. Build it. Someone, so the Japanese will buy it. Just build it. Between 1980, 1988, 19, oh, I'm sorry, 1986 and 1992, there were 11 buildings built in downtown Los Angeles. There was not another building built until 2017. That was the Spain. Because there was so much supply, they didn't lease it up. Therefore, the rents were lower. They had lower rents to get people in the office buildings. Therefore, the properties were worth less. So if you said, oh, we'll build the Taj Mahal, beautiful building, 100 million. But with the rents in there, the valuation of it is maybe only worth you know, 40 million. And values went down. When values went down, people lost billions of dollars. When people lose billions of dollars, they lay people off. They lay people off, employment goes down. When employment goes down, it creates the cycle. So that was that recession. Okay. This recession was pure fraud. Absolute pure fraud. The example, if you've seen the movie, uh, there's a there's a great scene, so forgive me. There's a great scene in the movie where Steve Carroll, the character, or the actor, goes into a strip joint. And he's trying, to, he's trying to talk to the girl. And she's trying to do like a dance. And he just wants to talk to her. And he goes, hey, I, I, I see that on title. You own, a, you own a property in Florida. And she says, oh, no, honey, I own five. It's a great line. How does someone own five with no credit? I'm not disparaging any of the industry or just trying to make it a point. But the idea was, is that you're a Walmart employee. You made $38,000 a year. You went to apply for a loan for a house. Someone fraudulent, like at Countrywide, or AIG, or any of these companies, reputable companies, okay, would say, oh, Mr. Guy in the Walmart, uh, you make $380,000, right? We'll just put it on the zero. And he goes, he says, well, I'm going to buy a $500,000 house out in the Inland Park. Two-story, brand new, Coffin Road built. It's great. So good. And he says, well, we're going to start you out on your loan at 2% interest rate. And the payment's $1,400. But in six months, their interest rate goes to 6% because you're a crappy credit. Right? And he goes, well, there's no way I can afford the 6% payment when it comes to 6%. That's $3,200 and I can't afford that. I work at Walmart, right? Oh, no, no, we're don't worry. At the end of six months, you'll just flip the house. And you'll sell it for $500,000. You bought it for four, you'll make a hundred grand. Isn't that great? What a great deal. And what happened was, is there were billions of that done. Billions of that done. So basically what happened was is then Countrywide bundled up all these loans and they sold it as an investment, like as income investment, right? They bundled up a billion dollars of loans. They sold it to AIG, and AIG was earning a return, a risk-adjusted return. The problem was is nobody knew that the guy made $38,000 because the application said something different. So when it finally went to 6%, the first guy he flipped it, did great. Same story. Oh, okay, now it's for 600. Now it's for 700. Now we're at 800. Now they own five homes. So what happened was is that at one time, you're just not going to buy a $900,000 house in the Inland Empire. You can't flip it. Interest rates goes to six. The Walmart guy defaults, right? House goes into foreclosure. AIG, who bought the, the notes, takes it into foreclosure. They're not a bank. They don't know what to do. They bought it as an investment. So the market crashes. Because billions and billions of that happens. I mean, billions. Market crashes. The, these companies that are worth billions of dollars in the marketplace, they're, they're about to go bankrupt. The government says, boy, we better bail this out or the whole country's going to crash. That was that recession. Lost 3 million jobs. Okay. We lost 3 million jobs in the current pandemic. Okay. Values of real estate did go down, but almost half of these two recessions. Does anybody know why? Why in this lost the same amount of jobs? So if I had the chart there for 2020, it'd be the same amount of jobs. Does anyone know why this recession? Those lots of jobs didn't dip properties. They dipped, but only maybe, except for hotels, because they got killed, and travel industry got killed. 
why, why did, we still lost 3 million jobs, but why did real estate values not drop as much? What's the guess? Interest rates are really low. Interest rates are really low, that's one. Stimulus. Stimulus. People got, still got money to keep the economy rolling. That didn't happen in the other two, right? Anything else? About the same, about the same today. But the concept was is basically the government held it up, okay, by keeping interest rates low and by giving people money. That's really the difference. Was. Okay. Now, what happened in this recession is they gave the companies money. So the companies were money versus the people. Since there was no major financial crisis, there was no companies to give it to in the pandemic. So they gave it to they gave it to the people. That's the difference. If you're giving a stimulus check, you're still going to go to the store. You're still going to buy things. So real estate values dropped, but they didn't get killed. Okay. Questions? We do it on time. Okay. So let's talk about the cycles. And, and the reason I'm going through this is that once you start understanding why real estate does what it does, then the money part comes easy. We're going to go through a whole example of the money part. Okay. But it's important to understand this is this is the real estate cycle. So you have the economy cycles, you have real estate cycles. This is the real estate cycle that is real estate related. In other words, we do it to ourselves. That first recession. In other words, we overbuilt. Okay. This is what we call the real estate cycle. This is the one where you get drunk in Vegas and don't remember. You wake up the next day, said, I'm never doing it again, but they keep doing it can't help themselves. Developers, we can't help themselves. Somebody gives me the money, I'm going to build it. Darn developers. Because, you know, we're a bunch of optimists. We believe our project's going to do better than everybody's. And it doesn't. So, so, so the basic four phases of real estate related, not pandemic, okay, not global financial crisis, but real estate. So, Real estate capital guys like me, we have to beat the, the, the world curve and we have to beat the real estate curve. We have to beat two curves, okay? It's really important. You got to beat two curves, okay? Curve, curve number one is what happens is you own an apartment building. You've owned it for 10 years. And let's say that the long-term occupancy average of that is 95% or 90%, okay? That's, it's 90% it's, it's 90 over 10 years. It's gone up and down, up and down, but the long-term average is 90% for that particular product. It could be office or industrial or, you know, things, things of that nature. Okay. So what happens is I'm going to, I'm going to start at six. My properties are 95%. I'm feeling really good. I want to make my cash flow better for my investors. So I'm going to start raising rents and see if anybody moves out. Right. So I start raising rents and nobody moves out. Oh my gosh. I'm now at seven. Maybe I'll do it again. I'm going to raise rents. Market's great. People are working. Economy's cool. You know, things are going, goes to eight. But as up happening is nobody's building anything right now or it's too hard to build. So there's nowhere for anyone to go. Okay. So we're feeling so good about ourselves because we're so smart. Da, da, da. So we start doing what? Building more product. Because, you know, there's lots of demand. My, my rents are full and good and everything's going around kind of thing. So we get to 10 and 11 and we're building. We're building and we're leasing. We're building and we're leasing. Point everyone's happy. We're building housing. You need housing. Build shopping centers. We need shopping centers. We're building movie theaters. Whatever you're building, you feel good about yourself. <coughs> we're at, we're demand for an apartment building or any product and supply match. That's your third drink of business. And developers, it's their third drink in business. They just can't help themselves. Smart guys do smart things. Dumb guys do dumb things. All right, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop for a little bit. You know, I'm gonna drink a little later. I just go, no, the world's never gonna end. 
I've raised rents for the last two years. I'm building product and it's being absorbed. I'm so happy. I go to the capital markets and they're giving me money, I'm borrowing money from a bank of 3%. My investors are pouring money into me. I don't want to disappoint them. I got to build it. I have to build it. Oh my God. Right? You keep going. And then you hit 12. That's where people are building your example in markets like Phoenix or Houston or Dallas. They added supply. The demand was maybe 5,000 units a year, and they were building 30,000 units. Because that developer thought his project, oh, mine's way more than that. It's just so much better. There's really some are somewhere. But most developers are smart. They built. There was a there was a uh, six to one ratio of supply versus demand in, in Phoenix. It's happened five times in Phoenix. They just can't help themselves. So what happens is all the supply comes. You try to raise your rent, your existing property. Well, I could go to this brand new property over here. They're offering me concessions. Has a brand new pool and a gym. And they move. And now you're you're you now have a vacancy. And all the new supply, because people will go to new product, they can port it. Because it's just nicer. Wash a dryer in the unit. This one was old. The rent was good, but you know. Now it's getting a little expensive for this older property, right? So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in. So what ends up happening is that rent growth stops and potentially even decreases and potentially even goes, geez, I've had like 25 people move out. I better lower my rents because some rent's better than no rent. You think the rent's $2,000 for a one bedroom and you're charging 20, 2,500 bucks and it's sitting vacant, it's better to charge 2,000 than zero. If you think it's 2,500. So you lower your rents. So all that supply has to fill up. Okay. So what typically happens is you get negative rent growth, all this supply. Okay. So we built ourselves into a recession. The banks start to panic, sell your property because they're protected. They have, they have they're maybe 60% of the total cost of the building. So they're protected. So sell your building, sell your building at a loss. We go into a recession. People think get laid off and the whole thing starts. So now we're at the bottom. You're sitting there and you're really, really hungover. It's the next morning. You're worried if you're ever going to be able to do it again. You say to yourself, I'm never doing that again. It's happened since 1967 times. We just can't help ourselves. Okay. So you hit a recession, phase four. Everyone's in the doldrums, but things start to kick back. People start to hire again. Right, the values have been adjusted. Right, you were charging three thousand dollars in rent, but your property is really only worth two thousand dollars rent. So it's adjusted. The banks have taken some losses. Your partners may have taken some losses. If you were smart and you held on, they still made money at the end. But lots of people lost lots of money when this happens. Lots of money, billions of dollars lost. So what ends up happening is you know we're hungover. We feel a little better. We had breakfast. I said, you know, we had a whole set of practice, right? What ends up happening is that the rental growth starts again because the supply was finally filled up, okay? But the rental growth is still below and your occupancy is still below your long-term average. Maybe you're running at 85% occupancy, right? So the idea is that, oh, so what ends up happening, the market gets better, things there, and we cycle. It starts all over again. So, Capital markets guys take this chart, they do this. Hold it up. They do this. This is for apartments. They have this for, yeah. You see how long Yeah, I mean, you could pretty much look at the chart that I have. So, what happens after a peak? is that typically uh, recessions run one to two years. You really not had anything more than, and remember recessions are, it's considered a recession if your GDP goes down from the year prior and your employment goes down the year prior. So you may have gone down for two years, you're still, everything's in the doldrums, but everything was flat. It's not considered the recession, okay? So typically two to three years down, uh, we've had two exceptionally long bull runs here. From 2000, 2008, that's eight years. And then we had 2012 to 2020, and that was because there was a pandemic. So we had two eight-year good runs, and both recessions were two years or less. 
and the pandemic was really one year, you know, from that standpoint. So those, those have been the averages, typically. Um, so what we do is we take that cycle and we say, which market, which product type is in what part of the cycle? And we make investment decisions based upon that. You could be wrong about this, but you have to pick something. You still have to swing the bat if you're going to hit it, right? So this was as a fourth quarter. Um, this guy Mueller, he's out of Denver. He works with a bunch of the banks and uh, he's a professor at the University of Denver. Um, and so you'll notice that almost every market today is either just about an equilibrium or in hypersupply. Few markets are getting killed. Did anyone surprise that San Francisco is getting killed right now? You've been up there? Ghost town. Absolute ghost town. The city's done a poor job at, at, at maintaining these companies there. So the idea, the idea is that they say this, and we do this for every product. Type. We do it for office, we do it for industrial. We do it for hotels, and I have a chart, and I, don't, I didn't put it up here because it just would have been too long. I have this chart for every product type. You want it, if you want to get this, and if you're interested, you can, you can type in Mueller, University of Denver, and you can try a um, uh, uh, cycle forecast. And he has all, it's online because he publishes it, and you can, do, you can look at every product type. So we all make guesses where we all are. So where am I not going to be right now? I look at that chart. Where am I concerned the most? Well, golly gee, <laughs> over here. So investors who are capital people may shift their investment focus. We're out of Raleigh. We're out of Boston. Okay. We're out of Salt Lake or Stanford or Kansas City. Okay. We're out of those markets. Which market should I be in? I should be digging around San Francisco right now. It is a it is a city that will come back. Okay. Long Island, interesting. It's there because of supply. Long Island was Long Island if you're from New York, and all of a sudden Long Island is now the coolest place to be, and they built 30 projects in Long Island. So I'd go check over there because those values, San Jose, Orlando, Miami, I'd probably skip Seattle. Seattle should be down at 16. They really overbuilt there because Amazon went up there and they built like 25 things. So the concept is where we are in Los Angeles, we're kind of at equilibrium. So it's time to be careful. Don't overdo it, be smart and think long-term. So here, if I'm here, I should buy and sell. So if I had, if I built four projects, okay, I would sell one and keep three, okay? And I can repeat that you build wealth and cash flow, right? So if you sold all four, then you're starting all over. You may make a lot of money selling all four, but trust me, when you're my age to your age, and that cash flow is coming in, it's pretty good. People get kind of greedy and they go, oh, I just sell all four, I'll make 10 million bucks. Well, where are you gonna put them? You're gonna go buy four more properties, compete, build, it's hard. Business is hard, okay? So this is how, us capital markets people look at the world. Any questions? Interesting, not interesting. Oh, okay. Putting you to sleep. All right. So if you are a capital buyer, like I said, got to worry about world events. Now, who would have predicted the pandemic? If someone predicted the pandemic, they had to have the greatest research team at all, or was in Wuhan and saw what was happening, and came back and said, oh my God, this is going to be terrible. Okay. So supply demand of your product type, really super important. Here in Los Angeles, I think we have in the whole county, 11,000 units under construction. There's 27 million units. Think about that. It's so under supply, even though it's at equilibrium, the reason it's at equilibrium, this is kind of interesting here, is a price issue, not a demand issue. You'd like to live in an apartment, right? But if that apartment's five grand, that's a price issue, right? So that, that's what the difference is here. That's why it's an equilibrium. So you have to be careful because if you're building a project that you have to get $5,000 rents today, be careful. 
but the sustainability for the market. Now, Beverly Hills on a high rise, probably a long time, right? Down here next to Benny's, maybe not so much. Maybe that's 2,500 or whatever. Okay, so it's always about understanding it. Okay, so we got to understand the whole world. So we have to be really smart people or lucky. That's what I call it. We also have to, now, if we're giving money, because I'm, I'm not the builder, I'm the money guy today. I am the builder. I'm the builder. I mean, it's important. Who do I give it to? Their track record. They're good. What's their, what's their stake? How many times have they done it before? Is it their first time? They've done it 100 times before. So who do I give it to? Where's the property? Big difference if I'm building apartments in Bakersfield than building apartments in Santa Monica. Different risk. Okay. So who I give it to, when I give it to, how I give it to, and where. So I pick my market. I have my reasons for my market. Good employment growth, supply demand, right, intact. The reason that LA is so on fire is simply because of the streaming business and the tech business. So you look at the tech today, um, you look at the tech today where the pandemic actually helped Los Angeles as a whole. Okay. It helped because it created streaming content. Down in Culver City, where we own three properties, Amazon just finished building a 750,000 square foot um, studio space, the Culver Studios. They moved their entire production to Culver City. Okay, Apple took their streaming and their Apple Plus people and moved them to Culver City. All of a sudden, Culver City's hot. Used to be Santa Monica. HBO was in Santa Monica. HBO just moved to Culver City. So three years ago, we bought two properties and told everyone that. This is gonna come the hottest area because we knew people in the business. So we bought these properties and it did, right? So our research helped us. I wish I bought 10 more properties over the last three years, about three. Because keep talking about, oh, I'm paying too much, I'm paying too much. My returns aren't high enough for my investors. But they ended up exceeding them because the market got so hot. Employment is the number one driver of demand in real estate. Okay. Um, so again, capital providers are measured in their spread, how they can perform over time. Whether you're a bank, fund, whatever the case may be, they are always in the marketplace of evaluating all right, I'm, a, I'm investing in the apartment sector in the Southwest. I want to see all the other funds who are investing in the Southwest and what their returns are. Am I doing better than them, worse than them, the same than them, and why? Right? Oh, we, we chose to pick Seattle. Nobody else went to Seattle. You know, all this, you're always measuring yourself as a capital provider of the business that you are doing because your business is to make your spread. And real estate on this side, not the development side or the principles and all of the other, the other seminars are, this side is about the money. And the money is very important because it, it allows you to build a building. It's pretty much that simple, right? It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's like, I equate the real estate business to like the movie business, okay? An apartment building is just a movie, right? I needed a director, I need an executive producer, that's the developer. I needed a director to make the movie. That's the contractor. I needed a writer to write the script. That's the architect. Okay. I put it all together and there's value. I created value. So I hope that building is a box office hit. Right. And sometimes they are. Sometimes they are. One of my greatest examples is the Howard Hughes Center. That Howard Hughes Center has gone bankrupt three times. Why? Forget the pandemic one. There were two before. Why is the Howard Hughes Center with Buffalo Wild Wings and Islands? And why has that gone bankrupt twice? People like that center? No, nobody? Okay, first time I went bankrupt. You wanna to go to Islands with your kids. Where do you park? Four football fields away in the parking structure. Do you want to walk that far to go to islands? Most people don't. But if you have kids, you do because you just you have kids. But do you go? I mean, is Buffalo Wild Wings really worth walking that far from your car to there? You could go to almost any. It's one of the rare things of that product type, which is interesting why it's there, is that people want to pour it up. It's the Applebee's of chicken. You pull up and you go in, you get your beer and your chicken wings and you leave. 
Don't walk 400 yards. So tenants have turned and turned and turned and turned. Buffalo Wild Wings has been four restaurants. Okay, four restaurants. First one was called Prego. I mean, you guys, it was gone before you even came to school here. Second one was Marie Callender's. It was, our, it was called Calendars, the upscale. Okay. There was a third one, I can't remember the name, and then it was Buffalo Wild Wings. Do you know why? Because they can't figure out the use for someone's really worth the walk all that way. I just want to go pick up some takeout. Can you imagine just picking up takeout other than parking illegally? The design of that product is flawed. It's completely flawed. I still don't understand how the, how the uh, Mrs. Fields is still open. She's an original tenant there. I still can't figure out how she's, she's been there. Who would go there and walk all the way to get a cookie? It just doesn't work for me, right? So again, if you're in a mall and you're going shopping, saw a movie, yeah, you'll go do it. But there's just not enough traffic there. So I, 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 just, think she, I just think she's probably laundering money from a company who sells billions of dollars of cookies every day, <laughs> even though she doesn't. I don't, I'm not really sure. You know, her register line's like this one, right? So always being measured, okay? So that, that's kind of the key, key to, the, uh, to the capital markets. Okay. All right, we'll take a break in just a minute. So this is how we think. We have to beat the curve, okay? And I know I say that a lot because that's literally what we're thinking about, okay? Because remember, this is the investment side. Don't be a developer. I got out of the investment, the, the money side, because I like being a developer, actually more than the money side. Okay. But people love the money side. So this is what happens um, with respect to kind of the overall cycle, okay? The smart money buys Uber when it first comes out. They figured that out. They did their research. They said, wow, that's a good idea, okay? There's a uh, buddy of mine who works for UBS. Um, there's a company called Procore. Procore is a software company that construction guys use to kind of manage the construction, scheduling, all that kind of stuff. He was an angel investor. He bought 75,000 shares for 10 cents a share. He's at UBS. He's a smart guy. He's over here. Four years later, it went public at $100 a share. He bought it for 10 cents a share. So you can do the math. A lot of guys are smart like that. Warren Buffett is that guy. He does so much homework, more homework than anyone ever does. And he's this guy. He is this guy nine out of 10 times. Okay. So what happens is, is that the company goes public, the institutions come in, the mutual funds start buying their stocks on the street. Okay. Oh, it's getting, it's starting to get buzzed, it's starting to go, it's starting to. It's starting to kind of, you know, get some buzz. But, you know, this right here, the institutional guy out here, got here, he goes, oh, I need my Christmas bonus. So he sells. I'm not kidding. I'm um, with JP Morgan. You just showed up, I need JP Morgan needs a quarterly return to show its investors. They sell. They did pretty good from take off their first sell. They did pretty good. It's not a terrible return. They made 18% on the money. Investors made 12. They got their Christmas bonuses and everybody's happy. Okay, so then what happens? What, what ends up happening is the public gets involved and they start buying stock and it starts going crazy. And it gets up to the very top where, you know, by the way, this is the exact model of crypto. It's the exact model. And by the way, this is, this is 15 years old. It's the exact model of crypto. Okay, so if you bought here crypto and you're there at the new paradigm, God, you did great. God bless you. Okay. Because you beat the curve, right? So the public gets involved. We used to have a joke in our business because I used to travel a lot when I was raising money. New York, Chicago, Singapore, we'd raise capital. And the first thing I always do is I chat up the, the uh, cab driver before we I cat I chat up the, the cab driver. I just shoot the breeze, da, 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 da. And eventually, when I always knew it was a, it was the delusion and greed. Is when the cab driver says the following. So, so what are you doing when you're not driving a cab? Always ask that question. Oh, I'm buying condos and flipping them. Or I'm buying houses and I'm flipping them. Is that his full-time job? This 
got a side gig, right? Why is the cab driver flipping houses? Did he do all the research in the stealth phase? Nah, he got all the media attention. Buddy told him about it. So when someone is doing your industry, when it's not their industry, we're at a new pair. We're at the top, right? So that's, so, so we used to make this joke. We go, oh, what the cab driver said, yeah, it's flipping houses. Okay, San Diego. And we've never been wrong by the way. Never been wrong, just asking that question. Oh, Texas is over. 15 months, 18 months later, everything went, everything went into the, the toilet. Never been wrong with that, but interestingly enough. Okay. So the new paradigm happens. The cab driver buys the house here in Westchester for 800000 I don't know which, where that house is in, in Westchester right now. He puts 200000 in, he's going to sell for a million two. Okay. But it's, it's, over, it's over right next to the freeway because Westchester goes all the way over the freeway. Right, that furthest area back, it's a two bedroom, one bath house. He's kind of a crappy job because he doesn't really know what that was. Okay. And he says, uh oh, I'm gonna sell. He sells and he sells it for he sells it for what he's in for a million dollars. Breaks even few. Okay. So what happens is, is that there's this little bull trap. There's this trap that happens where people start to panic. But Westchester is still a good area. If he just waited, he would have been okay, but he panicked. People panic with stocks and people panic all the time. Now, if you do your stealth phase research, you'll know if the panic is real. One of the craziest things about the pandemic itself is that we all thought it was over in two weeks, right? And I'm still wearing a mask two years later. Sucks, right? Remember? Remember when Donald Trump, where they forget your political affiliation, said, hey, it's going to get warm in the summer. We'll all be fine, right? I have a good friend who's a doctor and said, no, we're not going to be fine. So, whether, so always be careful of when these paradigms are really going to shift. So what happens is, is that the next guy who builds the house, he sells it for a million too. He made his money, but he was like the last one. That's your last drink before you pass out, right? So what happens is everyone panics. Well, I just got to get my money back. Well, I just got to get half my money back. I just got to, because things are falling, okay? And so what happens is, is that it, it, uh, it, everyone panics, stocks drop, valuations drop. It's all about fear. That's, that's when you're, the despair is how bad you feel the next morning in Vegas. I'm never doing this again, right? So, but you know, you recover and it starts over. Okay. So the guys and gals who make the most money, always, always be it. Because I'll tell you what, if you're here, and if you, even if you didn't sell, this return to the mean is still an index. In other words, again, just like we showed that index of the stock market, the hundreds were 500. So I'm saying, so even if he was able to hold on and didn't panic unless the thing went out of business, right? Or he could buy it back or she could buy it back at a discount, right? The concept is, is you'll generally be okay if you wait. If you can wait. We had lots of properties that we were invested. We had three year loans. The market crashed in 08, market crashed in 08. And I had to go to all those lenders and I'd say, hey, can we modify the loan? Can I extend it? Because it's due and we're not leased up. Some lenders worked with us. Some lenders said, no, we sold it. We, made, we lost. That's money. So, so it's a lot of times it just depends on where you are. Okay. Makes sense? In the world of investments. All right. All right. I'm going to stop right there, take a break, just five minutes. Everybody online, go to the bathroom. We take a five minute break, and then we're going to talk about actual numbers here with respect to, uh, to uh, an actual project. Okay? Good? All right, thank you. Five minutes. All this is, we, will, we might get out of here a little early, but this is the, the meat and potatoes. That was all theory. So, this is the meat and potatoes. Okay. And I hate masks. Okay. So we've talked about rates of return, how, how capital markets look at it. Now it's time to find out how a property gets financed and how a property is valued so it can be financed. Okay. In the real estate world, you have a few things. Companies' profits, does anyone know in the finance world what the company's profits is called? There's an acronym. 
company profits? Are, is it earnings before EBITDA? You guys learned about EBITDA? EBITDA is earnings before depreciation, income, and taxes. In other words, it's the profit of the company before they pay any interest on any loans they have, before they pay any taxes to the government, okay? And for any depreciation of any assets that they may have, because tax laws allow you to depreciate assets of companies or manufacturing. It's the pure profit of the company, okay? Now, if Apple makes a billion dollars, that company is valued at some multiple of that, of that number. So if it's, if it's 10 times EBITDA, right? It's worth $10 billion because it makes a billion dollars, okay? So very simple valuation. Based on the valuation, Apple can borrow money. They borrow money for, in order to run their company or to leverage their returns, okay? Because that's how valuations work. Real estate is absolutely no different. We just don't call EBITDA EBITDA. We call EBITDA net operating income because there's operations, you operate a property. So there's gross revenues that come into the property. You pay, you pay a bunch of uh, expenses and you have a net income or profit. So that building is like a company. Think of it as its own little company. It generates revenue, generates expenses, it generates profit, okay? So let's talk about some revenues. Let's talk about apartments because it's easier that way. What's the biggest revenue in apartments is? Rent, right? Whatever you're paying the rent. What are the revenue sources that, what are the things that you guys pay above your rent? What's that? Utilities. Utilities. What else? Parking. What else? Laundry. If it has a laundry facility, if it's not, what else? What else do you pay? What's that? If you had storage, right? If you had renter's insurance, if that goes to the property versus actually the, the things. So the revenues of a property are, is all that, right? Everything that goes into that, your rent, give a pet, they charge you a pet fee, or whatever the case may be. It's all the revenues that come from That's all the revenues of that company. Think of a piece of property, an income producing property as a company. That's the revenues of the company, okay? Now, the operator has to pay expenses. What is, what is the operator paying? in a real estate deal to operate the property? What's a guess? Mortgage. Mortgage, but remember EBITDA, right? Is earnings before depreciation interest. So the profit of the company doesn't include the interest. So what are they doing? What? Uh, maintenance, you gotta pay a maintenance guy, fix things. What else? Management, management payroll, what else? Tax. tax, property taxes. You have to pay property taxes here in California and pretty much everywhere else in the world. Property taxes, maintenance, insurance. You got to have insurance on the property just in case it burns down. You got to pay payroll, manager, okay? You got to pay utilities, right? You pay actually the utilities and you bill them back to you guys. So, you know, so the whole thing generates, you know, a big bill and they charge and they, they get reimbursed from the tenants. That's called a RUBS or reimbursement utility billing system. Okay. So if someone says, hey, what are the rubs of this building? Okay. It's not how it feels. It's what, it's what people are paying in utility reimbursements. Okay. So you pay utilities. So you have, I mean, you got to pay the electricity bill. Okay. So you got to pay all that. You got to pay the water and the sewer and the gas. And then you get billed back. Now, we don't generally, you're not being, if there's 20 units, they're not taking a utility bill and dividing by 20. Okay, because there's common areas, right? So they make an estimate of use. And sometimes you'll have your own billing, okay? But we always pay that. So you have all the revenues, you have all the expenses, and you get your EBITDA. Or in, in, uh, in real estate speak, your net operating income. So you have gross revenues, okay? Less than a vacancy if you had vacancy during the year where you didn't collect any rent, okay? That kind of gets you plus, plus your other income, gives you effective gross income, less your expenses is your net operating income. The value of the property is based on the net operating income. Now, if the net income of the property was a million bucks, we don't, like in stock companies, say it's worth 10 times its evident. So if a property is worth, has a million dollars in it, a million dollars of 
net income, we don't say, hey, it's 10 times, so it's worth 10 million. Companies are valued that way. Real estate is based on yield, okay? The yield is what someone is willing to pay for the property to get a yield, okay? We call that a cap rate or a capitalization rate. You are capitalizing the net income to create a value, okay? So let's do easy math, okay? So if I have $100,000 of net operating income here, we'll do, and I'm gonna, I have an example, but if I have $100,000 of net operating income, okay? And I, and I, I won the lottery. I don't have to borrow any money. hundred million sitting in the bank and I wanna buy a piece of real estate. I'm not gonna borrow any money. I mean, it's unleveraged. I'm gonna buy it myself, okay? And I wanted a 6% return on my money on that $100,000. In other words, I'm gonna pay for it. Whatever I pay for is gonna generate $100,000, which represents a 6% return on my money. You wanna understand that? It's really important, okay? So the question is, what, are, what am I willing to pay for the property? In that example, how do I do that? It's up on the board. So the cap rate is the return. This is the NOI. So if you take $100,000 and I divide it by 6%, somebody do that. What does that equal? Pull out a calculator or do it on your phone or. What is it? Somebody do it? 1.6 million? Close enough? Okay. So that means that I would write a check to purchase this property at $1.6 million and I would be the beneficiary of $100,000 of net operating income. That's a 6% return on my money, right? So we don't value it in terms of multiples. We value it in terms of what the return we want on our money, okay? That's the biggest difference between real estate and how to finance value. Okay, so now I say to myself, 6%, but wait, real estate's generating 7, 8, 10, 12% returns. How is that happening when I'm buying this at six? What are they doing? They use leverage. They use leverage. They borrow money. Okay, so we'll get to that in a minute. So. The way that we value real estate, so capital markets people can give you money to build your building or buy your building or whatever the case may be, this is how they value it. They take the value by taking the net operating income, dividing it by the desired return on leverage. Now remember, I told you we were buying a piece of property and there are 70 offers, right? So do you think everyone offered a million six? No, there were cap rates were all over the place. Someone thought the risk of this might have been seven. Someone might the risk of that might have been three. What's the value of the property if I buy it at a three percent return on my money? What's that number? Your calculator. So hundred thousand divided by 0.03 is three point three, right? So if this guy only wanted a three percent on his money. He offered 3.3. So the less that you're willing to take on your return, the higher the value is. Everyone gets that mixed up here in real estate land. Okay. He's paying more, which means the hundred thousand dollars is just a 3% return on his money. Right now, why might he do that? We'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the biggest thing to understand in the capital markets. How do you value real estate? If you're going to buy a piece of real estate and you see a setup, the broker sends you a setup, they'll have offer, they'll have revenues, expenses, NOI, and a cap rate, and that's how they got to their value. You may not believe all the numbers, right? But the idea is that that's how we value real estate. Okay, so again, if I take a million dollars, remember we took our million dollar company, and we had a 10 times multiple, made it worth $10 million, right? Well, if I take a million dollars of NOI and I want a 5% unleveraged return, okay, that's 
That means you'd be paying $20 million. I write a check for $20 million. I get a million dollars of cash flow every year. I make you 5% of my money. Very simple, right? And then I'm going to, I'm going to measure that against any other alternative investments I can do. Okay. Now, the way that real estate people have been buying cap rates in these three to five, four and five percent ranges are one, it's a function of interest rates, which you can borrow. We'll give you an example in a minute. Okay. Two, perception of the NOI is so going to go up or down over time. Okay. And three, most importantly, they use leverage. So that five is not really five. I'm not really writing a $20 million check. I may write a $4 million check and borrow $16 million. Because, you know, most people haven't won the lottery, so they just can't write $20 million checks. They have to borrow them. They probably don't even have $4 million. Most, most developers don't have $4 million. So they go get investors. And to get those investors, they have to offer them a piece of the deal in some respect in order for them to raise the money. Okay? All right. So let's go. All right. So this cap rate, whether it's a 5, 4, 6, 10, 20, whatever it is, first degree, okay, it's really based on the risk and volatility of the NOI. Does that gross revenue all $5,000 rents, but the market's all $4,000 rents? So is that NOI really real? The other way around. Is that NOI real if, if the market is $2,000 rents and my average rent in the building I'm buying is $1,500? I may pay a lower cap rate because I'm going to turn everyone to that higher rent. Okay. So the idea is that the volatility of the NOI absolutely drives the value of the property and absolutely drives the cap rate that you pay. Okay. And it also uh, it, it is also depicted based on your, your own perception of the property, your own perception of the market, where you are in the curve. Did you buy this property in the stealth phase? Did you buy this property at the new paradigm? Cap rates will go up and down depending on where people perceive the risk or the volatility. Just like if you buy a stock, right? The stock's EBITDA, Apple makes whatever, you know, $500 billion in EBITDA. What's the volatility of that going down or up? The stock price goes down or up based upon the volatility of that EBITDA. Exact same way here, okay? So the, the, the trick is, and the hard part is, is that when you're competing to buy property, it's all about what your assumptions are. You could have your assumptions, you could have gone back to the future, right? Took a time machine and went three years into the future, saw exactly where rents are because you're gonna build and buy a property. Saw exactly what it is, know exactly what the value of the property is, go back in time, don't make your offer because you know it's perfect and because you know the answer. And that doesn't mean anything. You're competing with people who whatever they believe three years is going to be. So if you believe rent today is $2,000, you believe rent three years from now is $3,000, you're going to offer the property and we'll show you, I'll show you how you get there. You're going to make an offer on the property based upon what your perception is, what you believe is going to happen. Well, there's 70 other buyers who have 70 other perceptions. Right. And that guy may think, oh, the rent's going to be 5000 if he makes a bigger offer for the property. So the valuation, and then what happens is, is, let's say that you win the property, right? And you're going to build apartments, you're going to build an office building, whatever. You now need money to go get financing. You have to convince people of your three year plan. You have to convince the people out there that I'm right. I took a time machine and I saw it and it came back. And, yeah, right. You won't get any financing if you say that. So the idea is that. You, um, you have to understand and do your research to understand what you believe is going to be the volatility of your NOI. And then you make an offer. That's how it works. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Okay. All right, let's keep going. All right. So we talked about spread. Remember, we talked about spread uh, in terms of my cost of capital, my profit and all those kinds of things, okay? People buy cap rates, generally they are, they want to spread, they want a cap rate to be a certain spread over the U.S. Treasury. And it should be, right? That cap rate that you're buying, that return on leverage should be higher than the U.S. Treasury because the risk. So we always try to have, there's, so 
companies. There's five companies up there that have done all their research. These have been the average spreads. The lines are just different. JP Morgan, uh, RCA, Natrief. Um, these are the average spreads of cap rates over the US Treasuries. Okay. So, so if you look at, for example, let's, let's do an easy one here. So in 2017, the 10 year Treasury was at 2.4, right? The spread was 225. 300 basis points, which means people were buying properties called 300 for easy math. They're buying cap, their, their cap rate was a 5.4%. Because if they can't get a spread over the treasury, you should just buy a treasury. There's too much risk in real estate. The volatility of the NOI is so great, right? If the spread's negative, I should be buying treasuries. Unless you really think that. So because of the exuberance of fraud, it was the only time where spreads and treasuries were the same. People were making so much money, they were buying and they didn't care. But the smart buyers, those guys who got there where they could have bought treasuries, got killed. Why'd they get killed? Because what happened in 2009? What happened to the cap rates? They went from 5% to 9%. We just did the math, right? So if you take $100,000 and you bought that property at 5%, your implied 5% return. What's that? What's that, Matt? I can't do it in my head. What's that? Two million. Two million. So you bought the property right here. Let's say that you did nothing with the NOI. It's just maintained. It's 100 grand. But the market crashed. The perception of that volatility of that 100 grand is now in jeopardy. So someone will still take it, but they want a better return. So now that high, that high one was at 9%. So what happens if you take $100,000 over 9%? What is that? 999,000, right? 1.1, 1 .1, 100,000 divided by 0 0.09? Should be like one to one, right? Yeah. Yeah, one to one. Okay. This guy just lost half his investment. He didn't do anything wrong. Didn't do anything wrong, kept his income the same. Maybe he didn't grow it or whatever, but he just bought a property at a perceived risk. And now he wanted to sell it. He was in that fear factor. He feared, oh my God, I'm gonna lose all my money. And what happened was, is that real estate volatility perception was super high because of all the fraud, right? All the fraud, the perception, oh, that risk, I, I need a better return because I'm scared. The volatility of that 100,000 is, is no good, right? So he didn't do anything wrong. He lost half his value. If he sold, he missed, he didn't beat the cycle, okay? Didn't do anything wrong with the property. Now, if he was just saying, I don't have to sell. I'm gonna hold on. I have a property in LA, it's gonna be fine. I'm not in Bakersfield, it's not a meth lab, okay? I'm good. It was for Bakersfield. I'm sorry, but I actually we had an apartment building for two meth labs are going on long term. So if you just waited, you still did nothing, you didn't lose any money. And they went back to five percent. There's a volatility without anything happening with the property. The value just went up, down 50%, up 50%, doing nothing with the property other than maintaining its NOI. So capital guys got to be the world curve, the supply curve, and the cap curve. You have to be them all. That's what we do. So we invest in properties where we think we're... <laughs> Why people lose money in real estate is they panic with that company. Or the construction lender panics. Or the loan the lender panics. Or your partner panics. If you have an institutional JV equity guy, they may have a pool of... You know, JP Morgan, they have their real estate fund seven, it's a billion dollars. There's 60 properties in there. They've sold 50 of the 60 properties, right? They've made a whole bunch of money because they go, they did good. They beat the curve. The last 10 properties, cap rates just creamed it. Cream the last 10 properties. But the overall portfolio does well. The JP Morgan guy gets his Christmas bonus. This developer gets screwed. Right? 
because they get to say when you get to sell a property, some, some institutions do. So again, you didn't do anything wrong. So as an owner, we have to deal with that. That's why I finance long now. <laughs> That's why I finance long. Okay. So this is literally um, the Bible of how people value real estate. But then as, as most people with Bibles, they put it aside and they put up their own perceptions after they read the Bible and they say, I think LA is going to do better. I think Houston is going to do this. Da, 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 da. So what happens? Evaluation. And we'll get to how you finance it. Whoa. Okay. Let's take, let's take that $100,000 of NOI. And let's say the average rents in this building I'm using apartments because it's easy. Or $1,500. Okay. Let's say that the market, I believe, I'm going to fix them up. Put washer dryers in the units, new countertops, new flooring, makes it look cool, you know, paint the building. It, it needs tender, loving care. But based on that, based on that, I think I get $2,000. But I have to spend money to do that. Okay. So let's say, for example, let's say, for example, that I bought the building for a million five. Okay. I'm going to spend, I'm going to call it $400,000. Okay. And $400,000 in fixing it up, closing costs, legal fees, everything to buy the property, everything to pay the contractors to fix the property up, to buy the toilets because I'm putting new toilets in. Okay. We do this, this as a value add proposition, okay? So I spend 400,000, so I'm in for a million nine, okay? I'm in for a million nine. Remember, I bought the property as is with a $100,000 NOI. Yeah? What's the difference between the three curves again? The what? Oh, the three curves that we have to fight. We fight the world curve. We can't control that one. That's the pandemics, and the frauds of the world if I'm not committing fraud, right? So it's the world curve, okay? That's the first curve. The cap rate curve, the perception of risk of your product that you build, okay? So the cap rate curve, the world curve, and the supply curve, the demand supply characteristics of your property, okay? <laughs> we <to> back <laughs> like that. Okay. So I'm going to stabilize this property. And let's say that I, I was able to move the, I was able to move the income, the net income, because I turned over all the units, created value. And now my, my income is 130,000. Okay. So. These numbers are a little skewed, but it's okay. What did I, what was the cap rate I bought the property for? Bought the property for a million five, there's $100,000 of income. What did I buy the, how do I figure that out? What's my yield? So I take 100,000 and I divide it by what I bought it for. And that's what? 6.6%. I bought a six. So if I bought the property and did nothing, in all cash, I haven't leveraged anything yet. Okay, I bought the property for all cash. I'm getting 6.6% .6 return on my money. Okay, we always do an analysis. I'll get to how we finance this in a minute. Is 400 the right number for the rent I'm going to get? Okay, so I'm now in, I now I have 130,000 and I'm in for a million nine. What's my yield now? Six point eight. Six point eight percent. I have increased my yield, not very much. I just I'm doing this more off the cuff here. But I've increased my yield by improving the property. Okay. So that's what we call a vacuum. You can take any property, whether it's a shopping center, a hotel, an apartment building, an office building. I bought it for whatever it was vacant and I filled it. All I did is I bought it for a certain yield. I created value. Okay. Now, if the cap rate 
This is stabilized, fixed up. It's brand new. I have balloon sirens, banners. I serve nice chocolate chip cookies when people walk in. It's a really cool place now, a tip or whatever. And someone's going to buy this risk now. I took this and I took risk to get it to here. Someone's going to buy this risk. Okay. The perception is, is let's say that they buy this at a 5% return. This is my return if I just hold it. Okay. That's my return. So let's say someone's going to buy that at a five, and we'll get how we why he's doing that from leverage standpoint. Okay, so therefore, what's the value of the property if he's buying at a five cap? I have one hundred thirty thousand of, of income. What's the value of the property? I always encourage people to practice. What is it? Two point six million. Two point six million. So he bought it for two point six million dollars. He's going to get a five percent return. Remember, I'm not leveraged anything yet. Okay, so the difference between my yield and what someone's willing to buy it for is called the developer spread. I have a positive spread of 1.8%, my yield to what I'm willing to sell for. That yield creates a value of $700,000. This 1.8% over 130 is $700,000. Yeah. Could you repeat what that's for? This is called the developer spread. Or the owner spread, but I call it developer spread. So, you're that one. so the concept of valuing property and how why people finance properties, okay, is creating value. This is an example of creating value of an existing property. I bought something, fixed it up, I raised rents, I created value. I'm in for a million nine. I sell it for I make seven hundred thousand dollars on my million nine investment. Pretty good return, right? Be good. That's the business. Okay, you can go. That's good. That's it. Okay. So the trick is, you can go to the next slide. Okay? The trick is that you don't have a million five sitting in your pocket, right? Anyone have a million five in their pocket? You can give it to me, but nobody has a million five. Now think about when you're doing deals when they're $30 million or $40 million. Okay. Now, even if you won the lottery, you probably would not want to put $40 million of your own money in a deal unless you really just don't care because you're putting too much risk into one thing. And if you have $40 million, right? And let's say you borrow 30 million at 10, how many deals can I do versus the one? I can do four, right? Diversifying my own thing by borrowing money. So diversify my portfolio, it also gives you risk. So the way it works here, is we, the developer model, the profit model, the reason we would show the profit models because you're gonna to have to show an investor in the capital markets that profit, okay? So developer profit model is the, de the developer's value is where his basis is, 130,000 over a million nine. That's the developer value. So in other words, if he just kept it, he's great. Make 6.68% on his money. He's collected that 130,000, pay for his college kids education for one year, and we go from there, right? Well, no one, no one thinks that's funny, but it's true. <laughs> okay, so the idea of the completed value, in other words, taking risk out of it, it's now beautiful. The guy doesn't have to do all the work. Trust me, that works hard. That works hard. Placing kitchens, painting things, and finding all the plumbing that's wrong, and the roof's about to fall apart. Trust me, it's hard. He's willing to pay a premium because all that work has been done, right? So he pays a premium. That's the 5% cap rate. You take the completed values, the net income over what someone's willing to pay for that NOI. And the difference is your developer spread. Now, let's say that you built this thing for, you built it, you got to a 6.8. And the market goes nuts. The market panicked in the, in the financial crisis. You have to sell for whatever reason. And the market says, ah, it's an eight cap now because, you know, I, I don't the volatility of that NOI. You know, I'm scared of the volatility. So I want cushion. Well, you now have a negative spread, <laughs> right? 1.2% negative spread. What is 130,000 over 8%? 
that's what the market's willing to pay. What's the, what's the market willing to pay? Is there 1.6? Okay. So they're willing to pay 1.6. Well, shoot. You lost 300,000 bucks. In my example. You didn't do anything wrong. The only thing that was wrong was that the world's perception of your NOI is different. That's all. So that's the, that's the third, as we said you know, earlier, that's the third risk is just doing that. So timing is very, very important. I know people say location, location, location in real estate, if you've ever heard that, right? right? It's timing, timing, timing. Because if you didn't have to sell a property, if you bought a property in 05, but did not have to sell in 08, and held it till today, it's worth 47% more by doing nothing because of the perception of risk. Okay, everybody got that? Clear? You need to go over it again? Anybody? All right. So, all right. So let's let's now have a project. Okay. All right. How do we finance a project? This is a, a real deal that my company did two years ago. Sorry for the people at home who can't see that very well. Okay. So we built. Now, the other idea, instead of buying an existing property and fixing it up, creating value, right? I take a piece of land and I build an apartment building on it. My free value, right? I got to buy the land. I got to build a building. I got to pay for all the costs, right? And I'm hoping my NOI versus what someone's willing to pay for a completed building. I hope I have a positive spread, right? Very simple. Okay. So. If you take, this is a 100 unit apartment building, costs us 400,000 to build, it's on the west side of LA. Um, the stabilized NOI, remember it's a piece of land right now. How, how did I get my stabilized NOI? What did I do? How did I make that assumption? How did I figure out what my rents, what I thought my rents were gonna be? So part of the cycle That's part of it. What's that? Analyze the, Analyze the market. What's what are the rents are for a new product? What is new product going for? Right? So if a brand new product that I'm, I'm gonna build something similar is getting 3,000 per one bedroom, I think I can underwrite 3,000 per one bedroom unless I'm doing something better. Every developer thinks their project's better, or I'm gonna do it a little lower because that one has a pool and I'm not building a pool. So you do research, comp work, comp work, comp work, comp work, comp work. You exhaust, you, you go in and pretend you're a renter. And every single comp, I want to rent. Can I look at a unit? Oh, this is weird still. Oh, yeah, people complain about that whole design. You do your homework. All oh, the parking, second level. It's really hard to make that turn. Yeah, people really complain. You do your research. And we do exhaustive hundreds of hours on a property, hundreds to get to my revenues. Then I make my, my operating expenses. What's it going to cost to run it? What my property tax is going to be? I have a hundred unit building, it's worth 40 million. What's my insurance going to be? I call the insurance guy, gives me a quote, right? So the concept is, is that NOI has been vetted to the best of my ability. I have been right on, I have been right off. Because we are human. I've been way off. Just couldn't believe it. And I've been surprisingly too low sometimes surprisingly too high sometimes, and surprisingly right in the middle, perfect. Okay, that's the business. So who would have thought, we just finished a project. I wonder if I could do this, can, well, I can't control that from here, can I? Um, well, I'll get to it in a minute. I wanted to show one of our properties on a website. Can I do that? Is that possible? Yeah. Okay. We built a, we built, we bought a single family home lot in Mar Vista, near the corner of Sentinella and um, Venice Boulevard, just two blocks to the west. It was a single family home, guy was 86 years old. I, I just don't want to have everyone else lose what they're saying. But... Okay, she'll keep going. Um, and we, we bought it from a guy, he was 86 years old. He was moving to Arizona, he owned their house for 51 years. I think his basis was zero. We paid 2.1 million for the house. 
and we and we built 18 apartment units. Okay. So we we anticipated our one bedrooms being 3,100 <clears throat> and our two bedrooms being about 3,800. <clears throat> we went to the marketplace. Um, we went to the marketplace and raised money based on those assumptions. Those assumptions generated a certain return for investors. I'll show you how we got there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we built a building through COVID. Okay. And yeah, we opened in April of last year. Can't get to a right. okay. Um, we uh, we got to uh, open it in April last year. And we got 3,300 floors and 4,800 rooms. Shockingly surprised and happy that I beat my projections because I had cost overruns because of COVID, because we lost so much time. We lost four months because of COVID. People built the building, cost more money. But so our research was wrong in a good way, <laughs> right? But many people do their research to get to this NOI and they're just, just, they just think the sky could break saying the world, their property's better than everybody else's. They're going to assume a premium and they're just going to be everybody else and their NOI is wrong. So what investors do and banks do when you're asking for money is they're going to test your 2 million six in NOI. They're going to look at your revenues. They're going to look at your expenses. They're going to look at the ratios. They're going to look at all these kind of things. They test your NOI, see if you're any good at it. That's what capital markets is. Banks do it. Investors do it. They'll question everything because that's how you value your company is your ability to say, what will this property or this project generate? Okay. So that's, that's really the critical key. So that's a whole nother seminar of underwriting, right? I, I do a market section in my class where we, we, we determine how we get there by market comps and so forth. So since this is a finance class, we're going to talk about things. Okay, so I did my homework. I'm really good. I'm a homework. I think I'm pretty good on my two six, right? Now I'm buying the land. I made an offer on the land for six million dollars. Okay, I went to a contractor with my set of plans. He told me it was twenty nine million dollars to build it. That's the building, the physical building. Okay, this building, physicalness of this building. Okay. And as a contractor, I don't build my own projects. I hire a third-party contractor because I'm not crazy. So, and then there's soft costs. What would somebody think a soft cost is? Other costs other than hard costs. Hard costs are building. Soft costs are just not hard costs. What do you think those are? Permits. Permits, big one. City charges me lots of permits. What's that? Yeah, cost of, cost of the loan, things of that nature. But remember, think of my uh, think of my movie analogy. Who's the writer of the book? The architect. I got to pay the architect. I got to pay a plumbing engineer. I got to pay an electrical engineer. Got to pay an architect. I got to pay a waterproofing guy. There's there's every project probably has ten to fifteen consultants. A B permit guy, an A permit guy, an entitlement person. I have six engineers. Shoring, electrical, plumbing, HVAC. These are guys who say they're very smart engineers. And they say, this is where, you know, this is this pillar here and that light's there. They said how it's all going to get hooked up. They make the movie, so to speak. So those are all the soft costs. Right, that costs money, right? It's like I'm taking the product. I need, these are all the costs to build this thing to get to that NOI. So if I miss something, I can't get to the NOI. So your bankers and your JV partners scrutinize your costs. Are they realistic? Does it make sense? I'm building for $290,000 a unit. Well, they just did one down the street. It costs 400,000 a unit. How are you building that? You must be building crap product. It happens all the time. Wait, your, your land's 60 a door? You know, land comps are like 30 a door. How are you justifying 60? So you talk to your bankers and they get appraisals and you talk to your JV partners and you are telling them your story. Here are my rents, here are my comps, here's my costs, here's my GMAC contract, here's the cost to do it. it. Justifies the land purchase price because rents are rising, my perception of NOI, right? Your job, if you are a development, the development side is to convince the money that you did a good job. If you're on the money side, your job is to scrutinize the numbers to make sure that you don't lose money. 
depends on what side you're on. Okay, all right. So the developer value, just like we just learned, if he wrote a $40 million check, okay, is the NOI divided by the total cost to build the building. So he's building the building, what we say is a six and a half percent return on cost. That's the return on the cost, right? So big numbers, big things we use is NOI, cap rate, and return on cost. Everyone goes, what's your return on cost? What are you building to? That's what he's building to, he's building to a six and a half, okay? So then they say, okay, let's go to the marketplace. What is someone willing to pay on that yield when it's built? Person should pay a premium, right? In theory, because you took a bunch of risk and you built the entire building, leased it, it's hard. So let's say the market's willing to build or pay a four and a half percent unleveraged return, okay? Unleveraged return. So you take that, it's worth $58 million. So great, I built a project for $40 million. I'm selling it for $58 million. You do all the numbers all you want, but at the end of the day, I bought, I built it for X and I sold it for Y. Made $18 million, pretty good for a day's work, right? So the idea is if I won the lottery, wrote a $40 million check and sold it, sold it for 58, I have closing costs. Closing costs are like brokerage fees and escrow costs and title, like legal costs to put the contracts together. They usually run two to 3% of the purchase price, typically, okay? So I have to pay those out, okay? And then I gotta pay everybody back. I gotta pay, gotta pay the $40 million because I borrowed it, right? Oh wait, I didn't borrow it, I wrote the check. I take my 40 million back and I've made 18 million dollars, right? Or whatever it is, I made 16 million too. So if I take 16 million two over 40 million, I made 28% profit. Good day's work. The problem is I don't have 40 million dollars that I can just throw into a deal. So I have to get partners and I have to leverage it, okay? So <clears throat> I hire an intermediary and I say, here's my package. Location of the property, rent comps, my cost. Here's my contractor, my architect. Put it all together, and I hand it to an intermediary, and they say, "Go find me the money." There are two thousand banks that won't do this deal because it's too small. There are two thousand banks that won't do this deal; it's too big for them. So now we can now we play match up. Swipe left or whatever you do, right? Kind of concept. Nope, I don't do that too small. Oh, I don't do apartments. Oh, I don't do California. Oh, I don't do this. Oh, I don't do that. Oh, I don't do this. Hey, I do apartments on the West Side, $40 million truck. Oh, really? You go talk to them. And you can go talk to them. And at the end of the day, you go, no, nah, I'm out. I, don't want I think the rent's too high. I think you're analyzed. The volatility you're analyzed too high. And they pass. It happens all the time. So again, if you're on the developer side, your job is to find your perfect match. If you're on the money side, you're trying to place money for the perfect match for what your fund does or your bank does. If your bank only does $20 million loans and less, you're not chasing $60 million deals. You're a waste of time. So we call and market and go to programs and we go to events and things. Hey, what do you do? Oh, I bank, what's your size? Oh, nice to meet you. It's like literally like speed dating. We speed date at conferences, that's what we do. There's tons of conferences, real estate conferences around the country every year, pre-COVID, where you go and you meet people. One's called the NBA, uh, um, uh, the ICSC. There's 100 conferences. You shake hands, you see if you match. Oh, I build malls. Oh, well, I'm not your guy. I own finance malls. I build, I finance 40. So the idea is as a developer, find your match. The idea is the money, find your match. Okay. All right. So if I don't need anybody. I won the lottery. I'm buying a project. Yay. But now I need the money because I'm not putting it. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. Questions before I go on? Anything? Okay. All right. So how do I finance? I finance with leverage. Okay. I go to a bank. You know how you get a loan for a house? Maybe not some of you haven't yet. If you get a loan for a house, you get a home loan. Those home loans are anywhere from 60 to 80% of the value of that property. So if you bought a million dollar house and you got a $600,000 mortgage, you need $400,000 of equity, right? No different in, in real estate, commercial real estate. It's the exact same way, except that there are guys who created niches of everything in between the equity and the debt itself. Because everyone says, hey, how do I get yield? How do I less my risk? How do I do it? They all come up with all these creative ways to do it. So 
there are basically, and, and, and there are hundred hundreds of public and private finance groups. There's bond financing, tax credit financing. Um, those are whole kinds of, you know, if you had insomnia, just read the tax code, bond financing and fall asleep right away. I'm not doing that here. I'm just, this is a standard kind of finance world because we'd be here all day. I'm just doing standard finance. Okay. So senior debt, that's your bank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo Bank, Citibank, they all make loans, construction loans. So remember, I need a construction loan, I'm building an apartment. So I go to all the construction loans who will find me, see what's six, the 40 million bucks, right? And they're going to do 65% of the costs, right? So let me write this down. So we're going to take our building of 40 million bucks, okay? And remember, it was worth 58 million. Okay. The bank's going to lend you 65% loan to cost. How much are they going to lend you? I'm going to do it on the calculator. $40 million is going to lend you 65% of that. How much? 26. 26 million. Now, let's say that they believe that's the stack. Okay. They get a first trustee. Anything from the sale goes to them first. That's why it's called a first trustee, because they get the money first. Okay. So they take a different risk parameter. Now, they look at the loan to cost. What's the loan to value? How do we figure that out? 26 million. Divide it by what the value is. Let's say they underwrote and they believe everything you said. What's it worth? What's the loan to value, sir? So if you take if you take twenty six million, the same loan, right? They didn't loan you more money, and the value is fifty eight. That's the loan to the value of the property. That's the ratio. What's that? Forty four. Okay, so we call it forty five percent. That's how senior debt looks at it. Okay. So that means that the value of the property has to drop more than 55% for them to have potential loss. Right. So where do you think their interest rate is? If, if the property has to drop 55% of value, what are you loaning money at? Probably just barely above treasuries. Pretty safe bet. Now, People have gotten it wrong because let's say that income was 1.6, not 2.6. They're underwater. So they also believe their own NOI analysis. Okay. So they'll typically, they'll typically lend somewhere. This ratio is anywhere from, you know, 60 to 75%. And they want these loan to values to be kind of 45 to 55%. That's what construction lenders do all day. And they try to beat the curve. The curve is the world event. In other words, the property will lease, the value will be created enough to get them out. That's all they care about. They don't care about you. They don't care about the other money, right? So if I get 26 million bucks, how much equity do I have to put in? That's 40 million bucks. How much money do I have to put in? $14 million, right? We got to put in 14 million bucks. Okay. You have 14 million bucks you can give me? I don't have 14 million bucks. Then I put it in one deal. I'd rather do four deals. Now remember, if I went out, if I went out in our example, okay, I went out in our example here and I borrowed 26 and I did have 14, I would put in 14 and I'd make 18. Take over two times my money. That's pretty good. 14 make 18. That's a good day's work, right? Okay. So why not do that? Well, I don't have 14 million dollars. So I'm gonna put up some because all developers and le the lenders and partners want skin in the game. Skin's called your own money, you can't just not put any money in the deal. And you go finance or find partners for the rest. Okay. There are over a thousand equity funds that fund deals like this. They may not do apartments in LA and it's match.com. So you need to find your match, someone who believes all this. 
Okay. So if you're on the money side, you're trying to find this developer because this is your deal. If you're on the developer side, you're trying to find the money where it's there. Deal. Okay. So the key is the key is is that that debt typically it's around fifty to seventy, and they typically charge that eight percent will whack out because the debt funds. But right now we just closed on a loan in uh, Culver City, corner Venice and Hughes, uh, right uh, block north of the Kirk Douglas Theater. Uh, we started construction and we just borrowed 65% at 3.15%. Pretty good. Barely over the treasure, right? So, and I want to borrow the money as cheap as I can, right? Because remember, that's my cost. So remember, if I can put up $40 million and not borrow any money, I'm making six and a half percent of my money. But if I borrow 65% of it at 4%, I've now leveraged my return. I'll show you that, okay? Before I get there, the second one is mezzanine debt. Okay, again, these are just the most popular. Mezzanine debt, think of it as like a second trustee, right? A first trustee, second trustee, okay? That can be secured by the property or not secured, not have a trustee. Sometimes the first lenders who have first trustees don't allow second trustees, okay? Now, they're higher in the capital stack, they'll go up to 80%. So in my cap stack, in my cap stack, if I was gonna do that, I was going to do that. I borrowed 26 from the bank at 4%, call it. Okay. I'm going to borrow the next stack up to 80%. So that's 15% more. So if someone takes their calculator and goes 40 million times 85, is that 80%, sorry, 80% minus 26. What's the difference? Six million. Six million. So there are MES players or second deed of trust guys who will give you $6 million. Okay. For that, they're higher in the cap stack. They get paid second. They have more risk, so they should get paid more. Okay. So let's say this guy, you can borrow money at four. Let's say you can borrow money at eight to 12% here. That's about where that is. About where the market is today. I know it says 10 to 15, but right now it's about 8 to 12. And it, again, it fluctuates based on where people believe the NOI and the market is. So that's up to 80%. Now I can even do preferred equity. That's even weird. What's that? Well, there's common equity, which is just joint venture equity. Someone puts in the money. Okay. They're the last. Okay. You can raise money in two increments. You can have preferred equity, which means they get paid third before the common equity. Right. And the common equity gets paid last. So they get they need the biggest return. They're taking the biggest risk. It's like junk bonds, right? It's like corporate bonds, A bonds, B bonds, C bonds, junk bonds. They should be paid the most at the end of the day. So people that they're saying, I'll give you another 10%. So, you know, 4 million, right? 10% is 4 million. And they typically want somewhere between 12 and 16% sometimes because they're higher in the cap set. That means that the property value drops less. They have a higher risk of losing money. And then finally, you have the common equity. These are the guys that, um, uh, which is 4 million, right? Is that totals 40 million bucks, isn't it? Yeah, totals 40 million bucks. Now these guys, they're in last place, think their money last. Yeah. What's the LTC stack? Loan to cost. So the loan to the total cost of the project. Okay. So now I've created a cap stack. Okay. Now the difference here, the difference here with the last common one. They're just not gonna take a rate of return. They're the stock buyer of your property. They want a piece of the deal. They want upside. They wanna buy the stock at a dollar and sell it at a dollar 10. Because they are taking full risk. They're the first loss position. So these guys is what we did, 115 of those is we were those guys. We did three and a half billion dollars of, of that money. And for that, I negotiate a percentage of the profits. So of that 18 million, I get a piece. And someone says, well, how do you negotiate that? And I said, I did 115 joint ventures. I did it 115 different ways. Because, because every deal has its own merit, has its own risk with the guy. It's the first time I did the guy, I'm taking 70% of the deal. It's the guy's 50th deal. I'm taking like 30% of the deal, right? So it's perceived risk. And when it says, how do you do it? Well, after 100 of them, you start to get the feel of it. 
That's kind of how it works, right? So the idea and the reason, let's say that he gets, a, he gets a piece of the profit and that profit percentage over his money earns him 18% return on his money, annualized return, okay? Let's just say that, okay? There's a lot of people who go, wow, this is so messy. Three different groups. What if I just raised $14 million? And I gave that $14 million a piece of the deal. Let's say that $14 million earned 18%. Well, I paid more profit to the money because I'm fixed at eight, fixed at 12. I've now stacked my leverage return. Now, most developers won't take all three of these. It's just too many people, too many cooks in the kitchen. It's just too hard. You may have just a mess piece and JV equity. You may have a mess piece and your own money. That's what we did on one deal. On one, the deal we built in Palms, we, we, um, we traded some money from a deal in and we just got a loan and we did a preferred equity piece and we kept our equity in. And then we didn't JV it out. Okay. And generally, if you don't have to JV anything out and you take 100% of the profit, that's generally better. So if you have it, it's generally better. Okay, On the JV side, I would never ever, even if you won the lottery, put all $40 million of money into one deal. I just wouldn't do that. I'd rather do 40, put 10 million in 40, right? That's what I'd rather do, because it diversifies my own. So capital stacks and returns. So basically that's how that works. Okay, questions? Yeah, sorry, what is JV? Joint venture. I'm doing a joint venture. I am the joint venture partner. I'm joining with you to give you money to build this property. I am your partner. I'm your money fund. You are the developer, you are the builder, right? So if you represent a fund, um, like an Aries fund or any, any of the large funds, they're doing this every day, every project that they look at, everything that gets built, that they use a partner, that's what they do all day, is they analyze the value of that NOI, profit, and how they negotiate their spread. If they earn 18%, they got to pay somebody overhead, their cost of capital, profit. So every, every model here has the same cost and spread parameters, okay? So if JP Morgan raises a fund, where does they get the money from? Institutions, like CalPERS. CalPERS doesn't have a team to go out and find properties to invest in. So they give it to managers. We're a manager, okay? I'm a manager of CalPERS money, okay? What did I tell you CalPERS wanted to earn? 12, right? So if I pay them 12, I better be earning 18. I need the spread, okay? I'm not gonna take 12 and put it in construction loans because I only can get four. So I have to take that, okay? Banks pay you a, a very low interest rate on your CDs and monies, and then they loan it at 4%, same thing, okay? So the concept is, the concept is, is that each group has their own cost of capital where they got it from. And again, unless you're independently wealthy and you do it yourself, they have to make a spread over their cost, okay? So everyone goes, why, why do the GV guys always need 20%? Well, because their cost starts at 12. That's why. If their cost started at six, I could do probably every deal I ever wanted. Oh yeah, Mr. Developer, you could have 7% of the profits because I don't even need to make a spread over a four versus a spread over a 12. That's why the develop, that's, so there's all this perception, like you go work for a company and they'll say, what's the deal? Well, I want 70% of the profits and blah, 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 blah. The reason is, is he underwrote his numbers and that 70% gave him his 18% or whatever number he needed to make to make his spread, okay? Now, they could be greedy and take more or less or whatever the case may be. The concept is they have to beat their spread or they're out of business. It's like running a hamburger stand and the hamburgers cost $3 to make and you're selling for $2. You're just gonna run out of money. Same thing, right? Okay, all right, let's go on. Okay, so this is this is the stacking. Very much, I pretty much said all this stuff. I'm going to just but we'll talk about the joint venture. Okay, and I'm going to give you an example with no mez, just because it's just too much pain um, for, this, for this. And I don't have a beta pool. Um, in my class, I read over the board grant notes. That's right. So now, this is where we spend a lot of time. I have to find. So I first have to find Match.com with my banker who does my deal and wants to do my deal and look and believes in me, or I'm the banker trying to find the right guy. Okay. Now I need to find a partner. Okay. It's hard. It takes years. 
takes years to develop a reputation where people will trust you to give you your their money, right? So you make them a return, okay? So typically, um, typically a deal sits like this. I need 14 million of equity, okay? Um, most institutional partners want the developer to have skin in the game, typically anywhere from five to 20% of that 14 million. So let's say that they want to put in 10% of the 14 million. That means the developer has to write a million four check. Okay. And they say, well, let's say I don't have a million four. Well, I don't have a million four. That JV partner may not want to do business with me if I can't put a million four in a deal in a $40 million deal. Right. It's one of the barometers of skin in the game that you're real. Now, remember on the debt, I have to sign if I'm a developer, or if you're the bank, you make the developer sign a repayment guarantee. So in other words, Property tanks goes to, you know, goes and loses money. Whatever you lost, let's say that you sold you sold the building for twenty five million, lost a million dollars. You have to personally pay the bank a million dollars. That's what a repayment guarantee is. So they look at your net worth, your liquidity, your cash flows. That's what the bank does. Okay, the JV partner says, can this person build it, and do I believe the numbers? Because there's no guarantee for JV. JV's like stock. You buy stock, there's no guarantee of a return of stock. Right? There's only a guarantee that you made an investment with somebody and you believed it's going to do okay. Right? So, so they say, I want skin in the game. So most deals that I did of the 115 deals I did on the JV side were 90, 10 deals. We put in 90% of the money, the developer puts in 10%. Okay. And then we would split the profits anywhere from 30% to us to 70% to us. Okay. And the amount of money. And the splits were always dependent upon where we thought the volatility, all those volatilities in the NOI, the developer, the market, the rents, the assumptions, the location. Oh man, this thing is in, in uh, Echo Park in 2000. Okay, when we walked through Echo Park in 2000, it was not a great place. Now Echo Park's like super hip right now. Silver Lake, Echo Park, that area by the Dodger Stadium is all on fire now. All these young people are moving over there and that kind of thing. But back then, the perceived risk was different. So I wanted 70% of the profit. I bet if I did a, a deal in that part today, I wouldn't get 70% of the profit unless it was a desperate guy. The perception is different now. So you negotiate literally whatever you think you can negotiate. And as long as on the money side, you make your spread, right? The, the key is to make your spread. If you take 30% of the deal because you think it's so great, but you don't make any spreads, you're not going to do the deal. You just won't do it, right? So it's, it's always this balance. So I'm balancing. If you're the money on the JV, right? I got to balance the world, the curve, the spread, the, the interest rates, the supply and demand. And I got to also manage the deal structure based upon the risk. There's all these risks that are associated with all these risks that are associated with um, how people look at capital, how people literally value this property and what kind of returns they can get. Okay, got it so far? All right, let's go to the next one. Now I'll make it hard. All right, now, this is a very simple explanation of the power of leverage. Why do we leverage? Again, let's say I won the lottery and I put 40 million in, but I borrowed debt 4% on my NOI. That's uh, two million six. So I had to put in fourteen million dollars. Okay. So if I put in forty million dollars, I get to collect all the two six. So I get it all, right? Because I put out. I don't have to pay anybody. Okay. But I borrowed twenty six million bucks at four percent. So of the two six, I have to pay that interest payment, right? Okay. So I get a million five. So a million dollars less. But look at the math of leverage. If I wrote a check for forty million dollars, I'm making six and a half percent on my money. Right? So I'm making six per half. I wrote a check for $40 million. I get two six in return. That's six and a half percent return. Now, I borrow this. I still make a million less, but take a million over the equity I put in. Right? So if I take a million five divided by 14 million, I'm making 11% return on my money. The power of leverage. This is why people leverage. This is why you don't write a $40 million check. <laughs> Because if I can borrow money at 4% and I do four deals making 11% versus one deal making 4% or 6.5%, I'm much smarter, aren't I? Right? The power of leverage works. So each one of these stacks here, 
4%, 8%, whatever, right? Leverages my return even more, okay? Because I'm paying, if I believe there's 20% profit on a deal and I leverage that 65%, okay, that's a 60% that's a return, gross return to your money, okay? So the idea is I can, I can divvy that up a little bit and I'm still at the very end on my million six or my equity, I'm getting a better cash on cash return. I've diversified my portfolio because I'm doing four of these now as opposed to one. And I'd put $14 million in four properties, right? Okay, I don't have $14 million. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's do a deal, okay? This is the same deal as the deal, we, this is the deal I did, okay? So, six, 40 million to build it. I went and got a 65% loan, Pacific Western Bank at 4.2%. I went and got a JV partner, family office. They made their money in electronics. Uh, we were introduced to them by an intermediary. They made their money, they, they broker TVs. So they get TVs from Korea and they sell them to Best Buy. They're the distributor from Korea to Best Buy. They make a spread <laughs> and they make a lot of money. TVs, have take, TVs are really hot, right? So they take some of their earnings and they go, we want to invest in real estate. We want to diversify just in case the TV market crashes. So they buy stock to months. It's like, so it's a family office. It's a bank. It's an investment bank for the family. It's a family owned business. We were introduced to them. We said, hey, we have this West Side property building 100 units. We'd like you to put 12 million six. 90% of the money. So they went and they scrutinized my NOI, they scrutinized my cost, they scrutinized the market, all the volatility. At the end of the day, they said, here's your 12 million cents. They funded 12 million cents. Okay. So they loved it because I had to put in a million four. So our company put in a million four cash, our own. Skin in the game, big time. Okay. So I have a million four. My partner and I have a million four. We have 12 million six from partners. The next thing is, how do we split the profits? Remember, we're going to sell the property. Bank's going to get paid first. Right? Remember, I sold 58, $18 million split, okay? So now we go into what's the volatility and why? How good of a developer am I? Do I have a track record? Am I any good at what I did? Have I done this before? Which I've had, I've done it multiple times before, okay? So what was I able to negotiate? Well, most of the time, the money wants a certain return on their money before you get a, any profit. A certain return. Almost like a guarantee. Now, it's not guaranteed if they don't get it or we lose the money, they lost the money. But the first profits go to pay what we call the preferred return. Or think of it as like an interest rate on the equity. The best way to think about it, okay? So they call it preferred return because it comes preferred or before the profits, right? It goes before the profits. So most institutional equity players have preferred returns, okay? Why? Because I don't have 12 million dollars. Because I, I won't pay you eight before I split. Why would I want to do that? Well, I don't have $12 million. How many people have $12 million and give you $12 million? Well, they're going to want to prep on their money. That's the market. If you go to 100 institutional equity guys, 100 institutional equity guys have some type of preferred return. That's just the market. So I better make more than 8% because if, there's, if the return on their money was only 8%, I wouldn't get any profit. Right? So if the property value went down, we sold it for $50 million, right? And the PREF was 10 million or it's too big of a number, but you know, there's no profit to split after the PREF. Well, I didn't make any money. That sucks, right? But sometimes when you, when you produce an eight PREF, the splits are higher on the back. Since I gave you a little bit of guarantee, I want a higher split on the back, Mr. Mr. Money Guy. Or I'll give you, Mr. Developer, a higher split on the back if I can have a PREF. Everything's negotiable, literally everything. So it, there, this is just an easy example, giving you an easy example, okay? But this, I wouldn't say super standard, but we were able to negotiate a higher back end because it's West Side property and we've done it a bunch of times. If we were first time developers, it'd probably been an eight pref 70, 30 split. Because money, money's saying, hey, I'm taking risk, right? We're going, no, you're not. It's located in, in, in Venice. It's like, what risk are you take? Okay. So they put up 12, they put it back. So let's see what everybody makes. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So remember, we sold it for 58 million bucks, right? 
Everybody remember that? Now I pay my brokerage commissions and my closing costs and all that. I got to pay those typically. Okay. So that comes out of the spot. It's 56 million proceeds. Got to pay off the debt first. Right. So there's 30 million left. I got to pay off the equity's got to get paid back. I get my equity back. My equity is just like their equity. Money's money, right? So there's $16 million of profit. Okay. So $16 million of profit. They get an 8% compounded return before we go to 50. I get an 8% compounded return on my money because money earns money, right? Money's money. So my mine is just as green as it. Now, I've seen guys subordinate that money. It, no pref on the developer. Again, whatever you can, whatever you can actually just negotiate is what's key. So, how do we do that? How do I get the three four? How do I do that? It says it right there. But if you verbalize, I take twelve million six times eight percent times three. Right, three years at eight percent. Now, a lot of guys do this. I did it simply here. A lot of guys do compounded. You got paid some in pounds. Okay, we're not talking about that. Let's keep it simple. So the first three million dollars goes to them. If that's all they got, they got an eight percent return on their money. Remember, their cost of money is twelve, so they got they got screwed. They made a bad bet, right? They didn't make their spread. Okay, so I get three percent on my money. 8% on my money. So I take 8% times a million four, right? Times three. And I get 360,000 or 336,000 bucks. So I've got my million four, my 336 back. Okay. My 336 back. Now there's 12 million nine after that to split. 50% goes to the partner and 50% goes to me. So I put up a million four. I guaranteed the debt, I did all the work, and I got six four profit plus three hundred thousand on my money. Good day's work, right? If you do it right, okay. That's the concept. Okay, so the concept is now: what did everybody make on their money? Okay, what did everybody make? So let's go to the next slide. Now, so same twelve nine, same six and a half. Right. So what did the what did what did the uh, JV partner make? Family office. They made the three million dollars of preferred equity, right, or of their preferred return. They got that money in the hand, and they got six million four. So they got nine million four seventy four. Okay. They put up twelve million six and got nine million four seventy four back. Okay. Now. We could talk, we talk a little bit about IRRs, which are internal rates of return. That's just, in, that if you go onto an Excel spreadsheet, an internal rate of return is just the annualized return of a stream of income over time. Just a fancy way of an annualized return, right? If I made a 30% total return over three years, what's my average return? I made 30% total over three years, what's my average annual return? It's 10%, right? That's the measure against my cost. So I'm measuring that against my cost. What I'm making annually, okay? I care about how much I made. I care about my annualized return. So if you take, race again. So they made 9 million. 474. I divide that by how much money they put in, 12 million six. What's that equal? Now, the three years was the time they invested, the time we sold the building. We built two years to build, the year stabilized, and we sold, right? So that's why it's three years. Now, there could be investors who want to invest for 10 years and just hold it, keep the cash flow, take their cap. 50% of the cash flow, pretty good over time, right? Especially by leverage. So the remember the cash flow was a million five in my example. They're getting 700,000 bucks a year over here. Pretty good. That's a good return on your money. 
right? Concept? So what's that gross return? 75.3%. And that was over three year period. So my average annual return was 25%. Now, that's a simple way of doing it. We all run monthly IRR models because it's just an Excel spreadsheet that runs. IRR is just internal rate of returns, the annualized return of six. So you could have seven months where there's no income, six months where there's income, seven months where there's no income, a big check at the very end, and it'll give you the annualized return of that stream of cash flows. That's what an internal rate of return does on an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, I'm doing it simply here for the sake of argument. Okay, so they made 25% of the money. Pretty good over three years, right? Remember, their cost was 12. Now, if they had CalPERS money, their cost was 12. They pay CalPERS 12, right? So they made 13%. Now they pay salaries, overhead, and at the very end, they pay CalPERS. So if that IRR was 11, they lost money because they had to pay 12 to CalSTRS. Okay. Now, if the way CalSTRS works in the institutional world, and, and I use CalSTRS and CalPERS because they're probably one of the biggest investors, but JP Morgan funds, and there's a thousand investment banking funds that do this as well. But the concept is, is they do pooled investments. Like I said, CalPERS may do a hundred investments, right? They'll do a hundred investments. Let's say they only earn 10 on this one, but they earn 30 on another one. They look at the pool. They do for, for their report card. The report card is pool, so to speak. How did I do on fund four? Well, I lost on three, gained on three, and da -da. my overall return, we made our spread. And that's how you, that's how the capital markets views investing in real estate. Okay, so I made a 75% gross return. That's the one way we measure it. 25% annual return. We also look at multiples, okay? A multiple is how many times I made my money. So if I put in a dollar and I got $2 back, I made two times my money, right? Pretty simple. So the easy way to do this, easy way to do this is you take the gross return and times it times 100 and the multiple is 1.75 times. So I made 1.75 times my money. Now, the more complicated way to do it is take 9 million plus 12 million. So that's what, to call it, 21, 22, 22 and change, right? And I divide that over 12.6 and you get 1.75. So my gross return over my investment is my multiple. Why is that important? Well, I'll tell you. Let's say that you invested a million dollars and the next month, right? Next month, you got a million one back. What's your annual return? How would I figure that out? Right, it's 120% return. Does it be 10% more month, right? But what was my multiple? My multiple is a one one. So you could have great returns, but crappy. So it's always a balance between the money that you get back plus the return. Okay, so investing in one month and one, one month kind of things, we, we had some situations where uh, we bought a piece of property, we funded it, we funded it, we were the 90% partner. And like six months later, someone wanted to pay us a, a big price to get rid of it. So the, the IRR was astronomical. Um, the property, uh, I'll tell you which one, uh, down by the high school, Westchester, what is the high school down there? Before it's the smartest school or whatever it is now. Right next to it, there's a apartment building. We bought that apartment building in November of, oh boy, November 2003, sold in February of 2004, it's a 93% IRR. So we look like geniuses, but our multiple was like a 105 million. But the partner wanted to do it, and there's a big, we didn't want to do it, but the partner wanted to do it, and da da da, da. There's a bunch of reasons why. So you look at both multiple and overall return, okay? so. Half stack. So the juice. That so everyone's happy, right? The JV guy got his money. 
GB guy got his money. Bank got its money. What did the developer get? Institutions look at what the developer makes. It's important. A lot of times they say he's making too much money. Or he's not making enough, he won't be motivated enough. Again, everything's a balance. Everything's a negotiation. All the time, 24-7. Okay? So let's take what the developer made. So the total to the developer was he made 336000 in PREF plus six and a half, six, seven, eight, oh, I'm sorry, six, four, five, sorry. And profit, so he made 6786000 Okay. Now, when I talk about money earns money, okay? Developers, how developers make money is not by investing 336 or a million four and making 336,000. It's not how you make money, okay? The return on your money, remember I put up a million four, okay? The return on the money, which is the same return the JV earns because money earns money on the same green. Everything over that, we call that the promote. It's promoting, right? It's a promote. It's for doing all the work. That's your true profit. Because money is just your money, right? You have alternatives to put your money in, right? So if I say, hey, if I put the money, I put in a million four, and I should earn the same return, a 1.75 return or a 25% return on my money. Everything over that is my promote. That's why we do the business. Why developers do their business, right? It's called leverage returns. So how much am I paying of that 6 million seven to my own money? If I'm getting the same return as the JV guy, how do I do that? I take a million four times 1.7, same return. So what's that? What's a million four times 1.75? Mm -hmm. 2.55 million minus my money. So I get a million dollars, million oh fifty two six six seven. That's money earns money. In other words, my money was no different than the JV guy's money. Okay. Everything I got over that is my profit. Okay, so I got six million seven. I paid a million dollars for myself. Think about it. What if I went and raised that million four? Say I didn't have it and I raised it. And I, and I took all to, to the partner. My family put it in, right? So I still have to pay that, whether it's me or anybody else. I gotta pay them that 25% because money earns money, right? So that means that five million, 733, so bad with too many threes. That is my promote. That is for doing all this work. So if you think about it, if I do one deal at 40 million, I'm, I'm really wealthy. I won the lottery. I wrote one check, made 18 million dollars. Still a good day. Or 60, I made 16 million dollars on my 40. Okay. But I take a million four and I made 25% of my money, plus I made five million dollars in profit and promote. Plus I earn fees. I, there's a developer fee in there, but we're not going to talk about that because it's not the part of thing. So if I think about it, if I if I combine it together, six million seven over my money, I made almost six times my money. Right? If I combine it, so I made I made five point eight five times my money on one deal. So think if I took my forty million and I put it in ten deals. That's why you don't do one deal. If you're on the development side. Now, if you're on the capital market side, you look at this and you go, well, I'm making this and he's making that. I want 70% of the deal. He's making too much money. Had that happen all the time. I want 70% of the deal. Not because I think it's riskier, because he's making too much money. Happens all the time. So your match.com is to find this match where everyone's happy with the splits, everyone's happy with what it is, the perception. We've had guys that come up to us and go, oh, I want a 12 prep 90% of the profits. I go, why? Well, I'm the money. They think the money is the most important thing. And it is important. But for us developers, it's one thing on a cog of 40 things. 
I got permits and fees and marketing and leasing and running it, managing it and all that. It takes work. So there's always this push and pull between capital markets and, and owners of property. When you're doing what we call creating value real estate. Okay. That's buying a piece of property, fixing it up. Like we did earlier, or it's building a property and creating profits for profit development. Okay. So 90% of what you guys would do if you're ever in the capital markets business is you will do for profit financing. Now there are plenty of things. There are uh, plenty of things where there's uh, student housing, uh, affordable housing, uh, people finance golf courses and, you know, bridges, and things of that nature, bonds and all, all kinds of different financing. I'm just trying to keep it simple for, for the, for the purpose of this, but 90% of the world does this. Okay. So you decide in, in the real estate world, if you, when you take all the other courses, everyone picks a, everyone picks a, you, you talk to a guy who's in legal, right? A law guy in the seminars. You talk to Anthony, who's in brokerage, who's doing the, you know, that kind of thing. You're talking to Edgar about 1031. Okay. Which is if I sold this property, I have $5 million of profit. I got the taxes on that. 35% gain, right? Well, if I trade into another, if I buy another property with those, I defer the tax and I can literally buy a bigger property or I can put it in another property, right? And you're getting cash flow from the table. So, so the first thing we look at is what's the overall profit of the deal, okay? That's the first thing we do. So the, I, the idea is that whatever business you're in, you know, the finance is just one cog of it. It's a very big cog and because it's important because not everyone has $40 million to build a building. And even the ones who do, don't do it because they'd rather do full. Okay. So people work for banks and do construction loans. People do work for banks and do long-term financing. People work for equity funds and do the equity thing. I like doing the equity thing. When I was there, I did it for 18 years because I, one, I like the partnerships with developers uh, to some degree. Um, and I liked doing multiple projects. We did one year with 31 projects, 31 joint ventures. And I went to 17 different markets. And I was young and I liked flying. <laughs> no, I don't like doing that so much anymore. But it was fun. It was fun in figuring out markets, figuring out Phoenix, figuring out Dallas, figuring out Seattle, figuring out West Side LA, you know, figuring out Echo Park, you know. Um, you know, so I like that side of the business very much. Where I got tired of it was. In the, in the capital markets, 99% is a build and sell, build and sell. They need to make this 25 so they keep making their spread as capitalists once they're 12, right? They don't care about the cash flows. I'm gonna show you how the cash flow works next, which is even better. Nobody realizes that. If CalPERS, CalPERS has done a trillion dollars of investing in real estate, they never sold it, it's worth 10 trillion. And the cash flow is five times any of the profit they made on the trillion that they sold. But they have to turn it. People have to get paid bonuses. It's the crazy notion of short term lending in a long term clock. Such a mismatch. That's why you have to be good at the curve. Because the money, the money's the money. You need the money. Okay. You got to have the money to get that. Right. Until you can do it on your own or you just have enough cash flow for whatever the case may be. So let's, let's look at that cash. And then we'll be done. What time is it? Yeah. It's four. Oh, it's four. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Um, that was kind of extra. Anyway. I was going to do kind of the annual cash flows for people once they own it. But if you work in the institutional capital markets, that's 90% of what we'll be doing.